Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. We have the whole crew back together today. We have Trainer Road in Cannondale's Amber Pierce. Good morning, everybody. We have our head coach, Chad Zimmerman. Hi, everyone. And we have our CEO, Nate Pearson. Hello. (laughs) Nate, Uh, do you want to just roll in? I'll just roll in. Okay. Cool. Got to cover three things. First thing is uh, last podcast and Polarize, we made a mistake. we can talk about the mistake, but basically we were doing some math on a polarization index and we clicked the wrong cell in Excel and gave bad info. Lucky for us, Toy Man in the forum, uh, I said, hey, you should check us. People checked us. We were wrong. We took it down uh, pretty quickly and then we put it up the next day. So that's why there was a gap in the podcast. So you want to hear all about uh, what it was and exactly the math mistake, you can go in the forum. But I just want to um, say something too about like, setting your people up for success, especially in a high pressure situation like this on the podcast. And I'm gonna give you a, a juxtapose. We have software at Trainer Road, and that's our core and that's our release. Now, back in the day, uh, when it was just me, or for a long time, it was just three engineers, including me. And at any one time, any of us could take down the whole thing of Trainer Road with <laughs> one missed keystroke, like so easy. <laughs> and it happened a lot. This is like 2011. Uh, it, it very easy, right, for it to happen. And so what we've done to put that in place is engineers, when they put something in, first another engineer reviews the code, thousands, if not over 10,000 unit tests, which are like, they test small bits of the code to make sure that things like math are correct. We have hundreds of UI tests run through where they click through our apps and our websites and make sure things work. We built Raspberry Pis that emulate the Ant and Bluetooth connection of not only good devices, but bad devices. So we have a whole closet full of like 40 Raspberry Pis and like, uh, I don't know, we probably have 40 different phones from Android and stuff because all their Bluetooth stuff is wrong. And it runs through and it says like, okay, emulate this kicker with this dropout issue. And then we try to make our app do it. We have an automated wheel that runs on actual trainers to get that data running. Uh, We then have three humans like manually check every pull request for every code change that we have. Then we release things, we test it across uh, a dev environment, an internal environment, a beta environment, and then a production environment so that we catch bugs. Uh, and then we still have bugs and we work on the process to reduce it. But that's what we put in place because you don't want one person. But for podcast data, I was just like, ship it. Like, it was like, no big deal. Like, <laughs> didn't matter. Hey, you, you did that? Yeah, let's just do it. It doesn't matter. So um, I just want to say, this is a failure of leadership. You can see it. There should be a pattern matching that I should have, right? is that anything that you do public, you want to make sure that your your people have like support in that. I should know better than this. And hopefully someone else hears this should know better. Another thing we used to do, this used to happen to John. John used to try to manage the live stream at the same time he is live as a podcast host. Uh, <laughs> that is setting your people up for failure, right? <laughs> uh, so n- now we have Aaron here in the background helping us out. Uh, and we've had other producer stuff too. But that that's another example of that. So just in general, what we're, so that's one thing about leadership is you got to make sure you set your people up. And then two, what we're going to do is, uh, whenever we put out public data like that, we're going to have two other independent checkers that go from the beginning to make sure we get the, the right data. Okay. So we're sorry about the mistake. And again, this won't be the last mistake, but we'll tell you when we make mistakes and do it. And other times too, sometimes we make mistakes. We don't have to take the podcast down and we just, uh, correct them the next time. And other times, uh, this one, we, we just wanted to, to fix it because the, the whole thing, it was a special podcast. Okay, mm-hmm. so that's one thing. Number two, we have a upcoming vice president of engineering job posting coming. It is not posted yet, VP engineering. And I just want to uh, talk to you just for a second, the difference between a CTO and a vice president of engineering in our opinion, because it means a lot of things. What this job is, you would be a servant leader. So your job is basically to make the lives of engineers better. One huge thing is what is the process to level up our engineers? How do we make everyone better and increase their skills? How can we improve process or reduce process, right? To make the lives better for engineers because engineers, uh, pointless meetings and one-on-ones probably not a fan, uh, but great release process that makes their lives easy and they don't have to do anything. There's no bugs. Engineers love that kind of stuff. Identify stuck engineers, help them out own the release cycle and make sure we're hitting it own our bug metrics. So we track how many bugs that we release that we think we should have caught. How can we then identify how to fix those in the future, put more of those uh, unit tests and automated tests in to make sure those don't happen and all of that. 
Uh, what it's not, you don't have input on code. So you're not like saying, oh, this is the architecture or something like that. You're not picking technologies, uh, picking uh, things like that. You facilitate discussions so that the team picks clear technologies uh, or picks technologies and make sure everyone is heard and the goals are clear. Uh, creating um, uh, core values for the engineering team so that they can understand how they should build things, stuff like that. Uh, and hiring, for sure. Hiring is a huge thing. So that job, again, is not up. When it is up, it'll be at trainer.com slash jobs. In the next week or two, it'll be up and uh, really hope to get someone that will uh, join the trainer or leadership team and take us to the next level. Last thing I have to say, clarification uh, statement on coaches. So last podcast, um, Todd no, two podcasts before ago, last. Yeah. I had a, a few coaches reach out to me personally and uh, they thought that I said that, you know, AT or AI will completely replace coaches in the future. And this is a failure on communication again, because uh, that, that is not what I meant. And what, what I'm saying here is I believe that in 20 years, AI will pick workouts for people. I don't think there'll be a replacement for coaches for like skills, accountability, mental game, nutrition, uh, questions, race tactics, all that sort of stuff. I just think for picking workouts, that is in 20 years, it's going to be AI. And someone can quote me, we'll see in 20 years if I'm right. Uh, that is also the goal of AT, is to be better than humans for picking workouts for someone. And I think this is going to be a sliding window where it evolves, because I believe that uh, it will be better as it moves on, it will be better than more and more humans. Because as we, I think we all know, not all coaches are the same. There's some coaches that really don't do much and just give you a cookie cutter. Then there's some very high level, amazing coaches. Uh, one more thing too, that if a AI could ever replace a coach for all those other things, that's the singularity. We're probably all yeah. dead. <laughs> it's yeah, Terminator exactly. too, right? Because they, they yeah. like if they can if they can replace the accountability and the mental game and all that sort of stuff, it'd be insane. Um, yeah. So uh, that's pretty much the last thing. Maybe one more thing on leadership. When for leaders, if you say something and someone hears something else, it's a failure of communication for you because you are the one communicating it. So I hear in my EO mm -hmm. group a lot of times people say, "Well, I said it once." Or you see, it's in the line in this email, but nobody gets it. You have to say it multiple times. You say it multiple ways. You're not a clear communicator until you understand, until you know that the other party understands. Then you're a clear communicator. It's not just saying things or saying, you know, having a sign in the break room or having it in an email. You have to communicate a whole bunch. And if you take ownership of that and you just keep doing it, then you can clearly communicate. Um, and so many times you hear people say, well, I told them this and then they didn't do it. Uh, that's not how it works. And if you expect people to act that way and to be perfect, it, you're going to have a really bad time. I guess I have one more thing. AT. Uh, it's just a lot of text for me. Sorry, everyone. Okay. <laughs> adaptive training update. Right now we have 188 people in the, uh, beta. We have one bug stopping us from adding the next 100, but, um, it looks like it was just merged this morning. So after they verify that it did fix that bug, they'll be adding those next, that next batch today. And then for the, uh, the levels that we talked about, which is so everyone can see workout profiles and levels of all trainer workouts. Hopefully we can get that out tomorrow. We have one thing blocking us on that. It might be tricky. Uh, we tried to do it Monday, but then we had an issue. So if it's not Friday early next week, again, that's why we don't like to give exact timelines because a little thing can take a long time. Okay. Indeed. I'm done. Good job, Nate. That was a lot of stuff to Thanks. cover. You did great. Okay, I'll see y'all next week. Bye bye. <laughs> One quick note on the communication side. That's why we've had this podcast going, and we answer in many respects. We answer. You could say that we answer the same questions over and over, right? But the reason for that is because. If I communicate it one way, and even if two people have that problem, they may see that problem differently, right? Mm -hmm. So then as a result, when you end up covering it from a slightly different perspective, or Amber shares her thoughts on it instead of Chad, or in instead of Nate or myself, something clicks, right? And that something clicking is what you go for. So that's why this podcast exists is because of, of communication not being perfect. And because of the fact that many times we have to hear the same thing just from a different perspective, and then it ends up helping. So um, we're stoked to have you all here and we're stoked to get back to a, a, a normal episode this week. As Nate just said, adaptive training is coming along really well and it's super exciting. We also have other podcasts too, uh, that we'll talk about as we get on throughout this, uh, that you should be tuning in for, but first let's just go straight into Steven's question. He says, I have a question regarding sleep or rather the lack thereof. 
As we all know, typically the night before a race is filled with nerves and many of us, including myself, have trouble sleeping. I'm in the same boat too, uh, before a race, terrible sleep, right? Therefore, we often enter a race with less than optimal sleep. So my question is whether or not working with less than optimal sleep is trainable. For example, I'm a triathlete who often does brick workouts on Saturdays, trying to mimic race day as much as possible with my nutrition, transition, et cetera. Is it worthwhile to, to also practice these workouts with a bit less sleep than normal? Or is this only hurting myself? Does getting a shorter night's rest before one of these race simulation workouts improve my ability to race on little sleep? Or is it only harming my recovery and worsening the workout? As always, thanks for the great content from Steven. Steven actually just shared a great example of communicating something multiple times in different ways. Way to go, uh, Steven. So, um, <laughs> but this is like, I I've thought of this question before too, when I'm up really early, like for Leadville is a great example of this one. We'll probably refer to Leadville a couple of times throughout answering this question, but that one's really tough because you either have to stay, I mean, it starts really early anyway, but then you have to stay Leadville is limited and tough to stay in. So then you might have to drive to different areas, Chad. When you supported me when we were doing it, we stayed down in uh, Golden, Colorado, and then drove all the way up in the morning. So we had to get up super early for that. Um, so yeah, this is a common question that I could see people having. Uh, Chad, you have the you have the bulk of this one. Where do you want to start? Yeah. Uh, so so initially, I read this and I thought it's kind of a knee jerk response was that duh, no, that's not going to be helpful. But the more I thought about it, the more I came around to the position that this really is a fair question because simply exposing ourselves to any stressor can reduce the negative impact. I mean, if you think of as an example, heat and familiarization to heat, I mean, even before any physiological adaptations have taken place, you can actually improve your performance, go out on a hot day. And the first time it really unnerves you and it just it holds you back. There's this mental restriction, this leash, but then you ride a couple more days physiologically, not much has happened, but you ride a little bit better, you know, that you, you start to loosen that leash or extend it, whatever, however you want to see it. So, you know, I kind of moved forward with that. And then it, it came to me that Keegan has said, so friend of the podcast, <laughs> Keegan Swenson has said on a number of occasions, or it's been noted that he says he doesn't believe in altitude. And, and I thought, well, I couldn't wrap my brain around that because he doesn't let altitude limit him. So I'm, I'm like, is there a familiarity aspect to it? There can't be, I mean, psychologically, there can't be, but physiologically, absolutely. I mean, if you recall, when we've talked about altitude, acclimatization, acclimation, most studies cite that, that sweet spot being between 2000 and 2,500 meters. Uh, for us in uh, the, the Western hemisphere here, it's between 67 and 8,300 feet, right? Keegan lives in park city. Anybody want to look up what the altitude or the elevation is there? You don't have to, cause I've got it right here. 7,100 feet. <laughs> 2200 meters. He lives in that sweet spot. I mean, it's about as ideal as it gets. So there's probably a reason that he doesn't believe in altitude because he exists <laughs> at altitude. I, I got to clarify this. It is a joke. And what he, he's trying to say is uh, he doesn't want to have it hold himself back mentally. I think that's your point. Yes. Where he it goes is. up and some people get super scared of altitude. And he's, he just goes, I don't believe in it. But we look at his power numbers at different altitude. <laughs> he's, not totally yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's not a flat earther. Yeah, he's not a flat earther. No, but his, his power at sea level versus 10,000 feet at Telluride, completely different. Mm -hmm, and sure. we actually did uh, adjustments. And I think, I, yeah, anyways. So it's more of a joke. But the, the thing about the mental aspect, that is very interesting. Mm -hmm. No one is surprised that Nate is comparing sea level to altitude. I'm just going <laughs> to <there. laughs> we're, we're hitting bingo cards pretty fast here already yeah. in the first question. <laughs> but your, your point back. is super. Yeah, exactly. Your point's super valid though, Chad. I like it in the sense that sometimes we think that it's just that old duh question. But if you look at it, especially in this case, if you're mm -hmm. used to something, there is an initial effect far beyond or, or before physiological effects or, or ad adaptations yeah. even take place. I mean, think about it. If you're, if you're worried that one poor night's sleep is really going to affect your race performance the next day, then you enter into that race performance the next day with that mindset. But if you've done it enough times to recognize, ah, I felt this way before, it's not that big a threat, I'll be fine. You'll probably mm -hmm. be fine. Yeah. Okay. So, so on the more scientific end of things, let's first start by acknowledging that there are differing consequences of insufficient sleep. And specifically, I'm talking about the difference between acutely or, you know, a night or a couple of nights before a race or a workout versus chronically, which, you know, is usually on the order of a couple of weeks. So acutely pre-race sleep sucks and that's okay. <laughs> and, and it's pretty consistent. Uh, a study, geez, we're looking at three decades ago, Van Helder and Radomski, 
did a review and they restricted sleep for anywhere from 30 to 60 hours. Well, they looked at studies that restricted sleep between 30 and 60 hours prior to whatever. And, and they noted that the negatives were limited to time to exhaustion and rating of perceived exertion. In other words, we're talking mental limitations here, not physiological limitations. And bear with me, I wanna read a pretty long quote because it's, it, it sums this up nicely. Although ratings of perceived exertion always increase during exercise and sleep deprived, and we're talking 30 to 60 hours, subjects compared with normal sleep, this is not a reliable assessment of a subject's ability to perform physical work as the ratings of perceived exertion are dissociated from any cardiovascular changes in sleep deprivation. So put simply, we suffer psychologically, but physiologically and physically, we're still capable. So this is kind of why, Chad, you've mentioned, a, or a, a, Nate, and I don't know, all of us, we've talked about this before where if you have to get up early for a race and people really fret about that, or they fret about the night's sleep just before an event. And we've told people mm -hmm. that that shouldn't be your main area of concern or, or, or better said a poor night's sleep before the race doesn't mean that your FTP drops from to 150 to 100. Right. Sure. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. 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 So that's a, I think an important thing for people to understand. Amber, I'm sure you've, you've got some thoughts on that too. <clears throat> yeah. I just wanted to share it this is pure anecdote, no science to back this up whatsoever. But when I was racing, we kind of had this saying that the, the night of sleep, the, the sleep you get the night before the race is really pretty inconsequential. What matters more is two nights before the race. I don't know if that's actually true. So mm. huge grain of salt on that one. But I would say that probably the most important thing is how much sleep you get on a regular basis. So what are your general sleep habits? Um, and yes. while I don't have any science to back this up, what I can say is reducing your stress around sleep really helps. And so if you mm -hmm. just don't stress about that night of sleep before an event, that's probably going to do you a lot more good because uh, the stress itself is going to have an impact. So if you can just let go of that, that's already a win. And then if you believe that it's not going to impact your performance, there's also the benefit of placebo. So get rid of one negative impact, add a positive one, and it's probably going to be good. <laughs> Amber, that's you a just really jinxed good... it though. It was... <laughs> Now two nights before, I'm going to be like, this is the important night. <laughs> this is like, the I have to sleep. Thanks, Amber. Uh, you got to be like, it's like four weeks. There's like this one window that you have to hit. Uh, two, one, uh, Chrissy Wellington, who is probably one of the most successful Ironman athletes of all time, she would say she would not sleep a wink before an Ironman. Ironman world yeah. champs. So nervous. And then she'd go and win an Ironman, right? For those Think about of, how much yeah. energy you have to have. For those of us here that have like been to Kona, like even just the energy on that island the night before the race, oh my gosh, like I'm not even racing, right? And I can feel like the nerves and everything else. Like it's it's, it's really hard. But Amber, you make a great point about, I, I think of my son, he lays there in bed and I come inside and I'm like, what's wrong? And he's like, I just can't sleep and I'm worried I won't be able to sleep. And then I'm like, well, oh. you know, worrying about <laughs> it makes it worse, right? Mm -hmm. So, but that's, a, we do that all the time with a race. Mm -hmm. I. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point that I need to remove the anxiety from like my, my, my anticipation and fear of not sleeping. I just need to remove that entirely from it. Then I'm yeah, probably, right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Even if it doesn't end up changing my sleep quality at the very least, it just removes some anxiety and allows me to be more relaxed. And yeah. I don't have any science back this up, Amber. Well, actually I do, but the, uh, <laughs> uh, for what I think is to, cause it does increase your RPE, but for working out to reduce that RPE caffeine. Like it kind of mm. levels that. Mm. So it's not good long-term health or anything like that, but just for that one race for working out, I'm like, oh, I'm just taking caffeine. It's not going to be a huge deal. I'm going to be so, uh, my arousal state is going to be so high because of the race. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, how many times has this happened to, to you all? I mean, it's, it's gotta be over a hundred times. I bet for myself, oh, where yeah. I've had a bad yeah. night's sleep before a race and then I've raced <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Like, 100 times a well, year right here. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> so for everyone else who's doing it, be like, it happens to Amber all the time, and she was a pro and had yeah. it just fine. So mm -hmm. That's a good point, though, Nate. I mean, it, caffeine is a, an acute solution to an acute challenge, so, so we can just handle it in the moment. I mean, we're not recommending that you train that way, clearly not, but you know, in, in a pinch, that's an absolutely viable way to go. So very much along the lines of what we're in which we're speaking right now, there was a study roughly a year ago where the aim was to assess the impact of early morning training on, on the sleep the night before in elite swimmers. And what they noted was that there was a difference in the pre-training nights versus the pre-rest nights. Pre-training, they would have, or they'd sleep on the order of about five hours, whereas if they were heading into a rest day, they would sleep more along the lines of seven hours. Point being, 
is that anxiety prior to a hard training session was similar to the anxiety they faced prior to an actual event. So in effect, Stephen, you might already be exposing yourself to this challenge, simply getting worked up knowing that I got a really tough workout the next day. Okay, so now this, that, was, that was more along the lines of acute sleep restriction. Now let's look at the effects of chronic sleep restriction because this is, Amber's already alluded to this, we've touched on this, changes when you carry this out over days. And, and typically when we talk about chronic sleep restriction, the research leans towards about 14 days. So roughly two weeks and they're looking at under six hours of sleep a night. And what they've noted, a number of studies have noted is it carries both psychological and physiological consequences in this case. And in particular, I'll name a couple of the, of the effects. Chronic sleep restriction pulls really hard on our immune systems. They measure this, they see increases in pro-inflammatory cytokines. And, and basically my point being is that we're setting ourselves selves up for illness when we face sleep restriction on a routine basis. They also note things like reductions in your growth hormone, which is gonna have a direct impact on your ability to recover. And psychologically, just consider the importance of mood especially during things like high intensity training or what about sweet spot training when you have to sit at a really uncomfortable effort level for long periods of time. So my takeaway here is that RPE and sleep quantity and quality go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Chad, I don't want to take you too far off track on this, but, and maybe we don't have the way to answer this. So maybe this just feeds into another question and I'm probably just going to upset people. I apologize, but, um, I I'm, this makes me question the fact, because there are a lot of people that talk about training early in the mornings mm. and they're like, so I just have to do it. And I don't get to bed until nine or 10 o'clock because, you know, insert many, uh, valid reasons, but then I have to get my training. I have to be on the bike at 5 a.m. And then I have to do this. So they're, you know, fitting in somewhere around five to six hours of sleep on a chronic level. Yeah. Is that, is, so is this also like, this is a tricky po point where a lot of athletes think I need to get the training in, but they do so at the expense of sleep. Personally speaking, I don't think I'm tough enough. I don't know. But when I try to get up super early and do my early morning workouts, I end up having a long tail effect that ends up compounding. And then like fast forward two weeks to a month and I am completely exhausted. I'm getting sick. Everything in my life is suffering because I'm taking that sleep time and dedicating it to training. So I guess my question is like, should this be of concern for people that are doing that very thing, sacrificing sleep time to train early in the morning too? Yeah. And I think there are a couple of things to consider there. First, first of which is can you adjust your sleep schedule? Because you have to, for a number of reasons, not just to benefit your training, but to benefit your lifestyle and your, and your well being. But also this kind of shifts the emphasis toward quality away from quantity and more toward quality because people talk about sleep quantity. You know, I, I sleep 10 nights, 10 hours every night. Well, you don't, you, you might be in bed for 10 hours every night, but I guarantee you, you're not getting shut eye for those entire 10 hours or eight hours or six hours, which, you know, maybe if you get down to someone who is sleeping under six hours a night, but they're getting high quality sleep for those six hours. And I don't know how likely that is, but let's pretend it can happen. Then mm -hmm. those people are probably getting more quality out of their sleep than someone who tosses and turns for eight hours or 10 hours. So mm -hmm. and no, no hard answer there, but sure. there's a long term. I still, all the science points to at least six hours. And most of it points towards at least seven hours of sleep at night. And that's at a minimum for people. We're not even talking about athletes in that case. So when we bump mm -hmm. it up to the demands that we place on athletic bodies, people who train consistently, endurance, strain, strength, train, all that, I got to believe more than seven hours is, is necessary for people like that. Thanks Chad for answering that. I'm sure somebody listened to that in this situation was just asking that question. So, uh, thanks okay. for addressing it. Okay. So we talked to cute, we talked to chronic. So now let's see where there are commonalities between the two. Uh, first of which a lot of science or a lot of research points to the fact that we see certain impairments. One of them is in our cognitive capacity. One of them is in our ability to metabolize glucose, certainly important for endurance athletes, appetite regulation. I mean, how, how much more difficult is it to resist that donut in the morning off of a poor night's sleep? Increase in insulin resistance, impaired ability to replenish your glycogen stores. I mean, these are all things that are highly relevant to endurance athletes. So point being here is that short-term, probably don't need to worry too much about this, but longer term sleep restriction can have lasting effects on more than just your performance. So you got to see it outside of just that narrow, narrow scope. It's going to affect your life in, in more, uh, uh, bigger ways. And then uh, secondly, my takeaway would also be that, and, and this is widely shared in the research, is that sacrificing sleep to train can actually negate some, if not most of the training benefits. And, and one study that backs this up 
to an extent it was just done last year, uh, Saner and Bartlett looked at sleep restriction and they compared people who sleep, uh, they limited to four hours a night versus eight hours a night, carried this over five nights. And what they noted of significance, noted in a number of things, but what I honed in on was that there were significantly lower rates of muscle protein synthesis. But they also noted that they could maintain the rates of protein synthesis by, with the introduction of high intensity exercise. So, you know, basically high intensity intervals. So a couple points here. First, acute sleep deprivation might impact our ability to grow new muscle. That's of concern. And secondly, I'm not saying that high intensity interval training is a panacea for all of the detrimental effects of sleep restriction. So they looked at muscle protein synthesis with sleep restriction only, only over only five days, extend that out longer. Maybe there's a greater impact on muscle protein synthesis. And while the high intensity training may have covered it in that very short term, five day span, who knows if it would happen. Not to mention you're sleeping poorly. The last thing we're going to recommend is that you do high intensity training every day to compensate. It makes no like sense at all. Like a death spiral, right? <laughs> I'm yeah, feeling sure. tired. Six by 20. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> <laughs> let's pick the hardest workout we can do and yeah. pick a body that's not getting enough regeneration over the course of a night. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. That'd be rough. Okay. Cool. So now let's, let's briefly consider technicality. So a study a few years back by Fuligar was a, a systematic review where they looked at a reduction in sleep quantity and quality and how it could result in autonomic nervous system imbalance and simulate symptoms of overtraining symptom symptoms. Uh, they looked at increases in inflammation, decreases in immune system function, things we've already pretty much touched on, but they also noted a dec uh, decline in cognition. So the link here between greater cognitive demand of the event and greater performance impact of that sleep loss. So psychologically and mentally, we have to consider the differences in our events. I mean, if you compare a criterium and initially I was going to say a time trial, but then I thought, no, a time trial requires a whole lot of cognitive input. I mean, you have to manage pain for long periods of time, high level pain, sure basically your breaking yeah. point and just stay just below it. Right. So rather than compare those two, how about a crit or a time trial versus something like a non-competitive grand fondo where, you know, you're not out there to to do anything except enjoy your day, ride your bike, hit aid stations, chat with your friends. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's very different. There's not a high cognitive demand in that case, but something like a criterium where you're lining up with 80, 90, hundred other athletes on a tighter technical course, you need to be sharp. Yeah, definitely. And this just kind of go to me, this goes back to why it's so important to just build good habits over time because mm. it's going to help everything on a daily basis. Agreed completely. Okay, so one more systematic review. This was just a couple of years ago. Uh, it, it whittled down to 19 studies across 12 sports, and they looked at the impact of sleep duration on performance in competitive athletes. So I'm just going to hit you with the takeaways here. For, first off, sports requiring speed, tactical strategy, or technical skill were the most sensitive to you know reductions in sleep duration. Uh, longer term sleep manipulations were more likely to affect athletic performance. So again, we're talking about habitual, not just, not just acute or short term. And then no studies reported a negative association between sleep duration and outcome, which is basically saying that an increase in sleep duration was either positive or at worst had a neutral effect on performance. So, so put it another way, sufficient sleep at worst has no effect or conveys benefits to performance. And then an important author takeaway was that though physiological findings are mixed, you probably don't need to worry about a Spanish shore as one to three nights. And my, my personal takeaway, however, was what about the sleep quality the habits, the, the quantity that you carried into that? Because one to three nights is different when it's on the heels of a few nights of poor sleep or just general bad sleep habits or general insufficiency of sleep duration or quality. Right. And then I'll close and with just, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, if you have good sleep habits, most of the time, it's sort of, you're building resiliency into the system for when things go wrong. So if, if you have a particularly stressful week or something where your sleep is a little bit derailed, it's going to impact you less. If most of the time mm. on a regular basis, you're getting really, really good sleep. So getting the good sleep, isn't just about performing well in your workouts day to day. It's also about building resiliency into the whole system. Yeah. Super good point. Okay, so close with two overarching take homes is one, don't intentionally sacrifice your sleep. And two, don't worry too much about any short term or acute sleep alterations. Uh, so what I really want on this is to pull in the sleep tracking data hmm. for AT, and then correlate that with survey responses to what we predict your 
your RPE was would be on a hard workout to what it actually is based on just what you said, the short-term, mid-term, long-term sleep deprivation. See if there's a correlation between performance improvements versus people who are sleeping five hours all the time or nine hours all the time, and then timed with time of day, as John said, because we know that stuff too, and try to tease all those things out because that would be super interesting if we can mm -hmm. predict that John gets faster if he trains at 2 p.m. rather than 5 a.m. or people in general. Uh, that's, I mean, there'd have to be a strong enough signal for that to happen, but who knows? So if you have sleep trackers, please wear them. Um, the quality of the sleep, I believe, is very, uh, sleep trackers, I don't think, do a good job. I've done, you know, I've probably talked ad nauseum on this podcast about my own sleep issues with sleep apnea and that sort of stuff. The sleep trackers are like, yeah, you're, you're amazing sleep. I mean, and I'm like, I go into an actual laboratory and it's like, yeah, you're choking, your pulse ox is 80 <laughs> and it's crazy. And then now sometimes too, I'll have my CPAP on great night's sleep, no sleep apnea. You move around a little bit. And then I've also worn two sleep trackers at the same time. And one sleep tracker, uh, I went to the bathroom. One sleep tracker got that. Another sleep tracker didn't even didn't even notice that I went to the bathroom in the middle of the night. <laughs> but I slept all the way through. And this is a popular one that many people uh, talk mm. about. And yes. uh, I, I messaged them, and they're like, "Hey, uh, yeah, we just don't we don't record movement that's shorter than this many minutes." And I'm like, I, "But I got up." Um, anyways, <laughs> I, I would not read into. I would not judge your quality or if you see your quality is bad based on a sleep tracker i wouldn't just affirm it either way like that it's good or bad so the other thing that i thought of uh while listening to this is i have not pre-read any of these questions it's like i'm listening to the podcast live with you guys and i'm just like <laughs> <laughs> i had a very busy week and uh yeah it's all happening it's kind of fun just to go for long for the ride and chime in when i i see it so this is kind of fun. Nice you should cold. always do this. Yeah, I'm the red team. <laughs> I, I don't know about anybody, but like looking at this, I'm thinking about Cape Epic, about the sleeping during that race, like, mm. because it's probably going to be, so it's, it's getting squeezed on both sides. Right. In the sense that you have an immense amount of fatigue and everything else. And like, yes, when you're tired, you sleep well sometimes, but there's a difference between like being completely blown out from a really hard ride. And then when you also know that you have to do that again the next day, it, like I said, it's kind of pushing on sleep from both ends, oh. right? And making it kind of tough. Well, Amber can and probably Cass speak to the idea that when you're sympathetically all wound up, you don't get good sleep. And as that accumulates from night to night to night over a long stage race, something I've never done, but I'm sure Amber has, it, I, can, I can't imagine your sleep improves over the course of a seven day stage race. You know, I would say early in my career, that was the case, but later in my career, I got, I think I got better at shifting back into a parasympathetic state after a sympathetic mm. state. And I mm -hmm. do think that that's something that you can improve with time and with some effort. Um, and so I was able to get to a point where early in the stage race, it would be harder to sleep because you have all those nerves of anticipation. But as soon as you sort of settle into, okay, the GC is somewhat established, you know, the players you need to look for, there are fewer unknowns and you're really tired, <laughs> then, mm -hmm. then it, for me, it actually got a lot easier to sleep, but there was a big difference between the beginning of my career and the end of the career. Um, and that's, I think that had to do with just some experience and then, and my body just getting used to saying, okay, we could, it's okay to go back into parasympathetic mode now, um, because we've been here before. So, um, yeah, it was really interesting. That's a really good point. Yeah. Uh, caffeine timing too on Cape Epic over a stage uh -huh. race. You got to like, cause if you do it at the end of the stage, you're, you're totally impacted. And if you do too much, cause you know, it's the half-life, right? So you can't just say there's a rule of thumb, like, you know, no caffeine afternoon or something, but if you're doing double the caffeine, like at noon, it's like still like you took caffeine at noon based on double the half-life. You can do the math, but, uh, you, I'm not going to be doing 400 milligrams of caffeine each day, maybe on the last day, but maybe, you know, stages. 200 at like 7 a.m and that's it uh yeah it, or maybe some emergency on a really bad day but it is huge and i've thought about this a lot of um just getting back to the hotel too right because uh mm -hmm. amber said is getting that parasympathetic state is mm -hmm. extremely important and yes i'm not sleeping in a tent um that that sounds <laughs> miserable for cape epic plus it might just wouldn't work I just realized I didn't verify that. Am I going to be sleeping in a tent? Or Brandon and I sleep in a tent? <laughs> just you guys. I think you're in a tent. Oh. <laughs> Chad, I think you're in a yeah. tent too. Mm. 
when did you sign up for it? Hard no. Yeah. Oh, seriously? This is real? You're not messing with me? <laughs> I don't know. Did you oh, sign gosh. up for it? That's a, that's a deal breaker. Seriously, I'm not <laughs> sleeping in a tent and subjecting You'll myself to that. Yeah. All right, Brandon, you if you're watching this right now, can you start looking for hotels and then uh, we'll figure this out because we'll figure yeah, it out. tents can be cut off. You guys have to sign up for it yourselves. Brandon, please look into no, that. No, Pete right said now. he signed up for it. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank God. Uh, Brandon, please work on the AT release. We can yes, figure sorry. this stuff out later. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> We're gonna have. We'll hire a helper. We'll figure it out. Don't worry. If if okay. we don't have that, we'll get another. We'll figure out places for you to stay. It'll all be great, I, Chad. Uh, thank goodness. Yeah, I, I can see Chad just uh, <laughs> doing a hard nope on that one. So hard nope. I'd be right. And I'd be right with you, Chad. Uh, Chris's question. He says, firstly, I'm only a month into trainer row, but with the several years under the, he says the others, <laughs> and I'm just loving the podcast. And I must say in particular, the newer COVID safe ones is you actually see the body language eyes of everyone talking and it just feels more conversational. It's more interesting to watch. So uh, one good thing in these unfortunate times. Yeah. Silver lining. Honestly, like, uh, well, I mean, we would have made this move anyway, just so then we could have Amber on the podcast as well, because, uh, you know, having Amber on here is absolutely worth any of the, sort of that change as well. So, thank you. but it's funny how it all works out. Right. Uh, <laughs> so what role, if any, does adrenaline play in sports performance, i.e. it's off quoted that the excitement part of the nerves is good feeding the butterflies, but what actually happens does adrenaline help the production of ATP or help the production, uh, of, uh, I believe he typed that in twice, or perhaps I'm reading wrong. I'm going to move on. He says, does it help produce ATP to help us produce more energy and, or does it help buffer the burn and, or are its benefits more related to focus? So Chris is basically asking like, does, does adrenaline solve every problem for an endurance athlete right there in one, uh, which would be pretty darn sweet. Uh, if it did Amber, you looked into this one, um, mm -hmm. where should we start? Yeah, well, to dig into what role adrenaline plays in sports performance, let's talk about first, what does adrenaline actually do? What is it and what does it do? So to get into those definitions, adrenaline is a hormone, also known as epinephrine, and it works in tandem with noradrenaline, which is also known as norepinephrine. And these hormones fall into a group of special hormones called catecholamines. Dopamine is another type of hormone that falls into this group called catecholamines. So let's step back a little bit and review, hormones are chemical messengers and they're produced and stored in glandular tissues. And then when they're needed, they're released into the circulation of body fluids like blood or lymph. And they can be released in a generalized manner through wide circulation where they would encounter a lot of different tissues, but they would only affect target tissues that actually have the receptors that can affect those, that can accept those specific hormones. You can also have a local release where it's released a particular hormone is released by specific nerve endings. So it's only released locally and it's rapidly metabolized. So it's only really going to affect a small area. So catecholamines are a subset, a, a type or a group of specific hormones that include epinephrine, norepinephrine, or adrenaline, noradrenaline. And these are produced in the adrenal glands. Also, um, and if you want to get more specific, they're specifically produced in the adrenal medulla. They're also secreted by the adrenal glands but they're also secreted by symp the sympathetic nervous system. So not only in the adrenal glands, but also by these specific nerve endings that are a part of the symp sympathetic nervous system. So the local effects, that local release is at the sympathetic nerve endings, but you also get a general release through spillover from the release at the nerve endings and also from release at the adrenal medulla. Okay. So the sympathetic activity, so again, this is, you know, it's associated with the sympathetic nervous system. So sympathetic activity stimulates secretion from the adrenal medulla of both the norepinephrine and epinephrine. And these two catecholamines function together to create a really, really powerful physiological response because that adrenaline rush, right? It's preparing you for intense physical activity. So the effects of these hormones depend on the receptors that they, that they encounter. So these use what's called adrenergic receptors, and there's three types of those. So each type is going to elicit different effects. And it also depends on the tissue type that gets encountered. So what is the tissue that's being encountered by these hormones? And what is the tissue going to, how is the tissue going to respond based on this action from the hormone? So adrenaline actually does a lot of really cool things that benefit performance. So let's look at some of those. It can increase blood delivery. It can open up your airways. 
It can increase the availability of fuel and it can actually <laughs> increase visual acuity, if you can believe that. Pretty cool. So how does it increase blood delivery? Um, it does this by constricting minor blood vessels. So it's reducing blood flow in areas where it's not as needed and it's opening up blood flow through vasodilation in the scale, increase the output of blood. So you know, you're increasing the output of blood and you're also making it easier for the blood to get to where it needs to go. Um, this can also increase blood pressure. And then the way that it opens up your airways is these catecholamines act on the smooth muscle that opens up the airways through bronchodilation. And then in order to increase the availability, availability of fuel, adrenaline can also increase the breakdown of glycogen into glucose in the liver. So it'll raise glucose availability in the blood. It also stimulates lipolysis though. So it's not just glucose as fuel. It's also releasing a higher, a higher amount of free fatty acids into circulation. So you have more glucose available, more free fatty acids available. Sounds pretty good. And then this visual acuity thing, this is pretty cool. Uh, catecholamines can contract the muscles around the iris. And so that pupil dilation can enable increased visual acuity. Who knew all of these things seem very, very beneficial for, for performance. If you ask me, um, so how does this actually relate to exercise? Well, the release of catecholamines is mediated by the symp sympathetic nervous system. Um, again, so this is going to affect the, the sympathetic nervous system neurons and the adrenal medulla. And so when you're doing mild to moderate intensity exercise, where you don't really see much of a decline in blood glucose, there's very little, if any effect on circulating catecholamine levels. But when you start to do harder work at higher intensities, getting up above 50% of VO2 max, blood catecholamine levels start to increase. What's really interesting about this is the effects of training on the release of catecholamines. So training is going to shift your threshold for the release of catecholamines because what constitutes mild to moderate intensity for you is going to change as you get fitter, which kind of sounds like it might not be beneficial because if you have to work harder and harder and harder, the fitter mm -hmm. you get in order to get the benefit of these catecholamines, it seems counterintuitive that this would be a good thing, but this is where it gets really interesting. If you haven't been interested already, <laughs> um, <laughs> your body gets better at releasing catecholamines. So the fitter you are, the better your body is at releasing and using catecholamines. So the catecholamine release gets exaggerated in trained ind individuals versus untrained individuals because trained individuals develop what's called a feed forward mechanism that allows where your body gets better at this. So it might not be until a higher intensity, a higher intensity or higher absolute intensity level that you're able to release the catecholamines. But once you get there, you're going to be able to release, release them better and use them better than somebody who is an untrained individual. So there is actually a really cool benefit to the fitness component of this. Um, so let's get back to some of those specific questions. Does adrenaline help the production of ATP to help us produce more energy? Not directly. So the hormone itself is not going to interact with the production mechanisms of ATP, but it's making more fuel available for the production of ATP. So the answer to this is probably indirectly. Yes, but not directly. Sure. Does it help buffer the burn again, not directly, but maybe indirectly. And this is, <laughs> this is really, I, I found this study. It's very cool. Please take it with a massive grain of salt. It's a study on rats. So this should send up big red flags <laughs> that we might, might not be able to translate this one-to-one -to, -one to humans, but it raises a really interesting potential mechanistic explanation for this. So they looked at uh, muscle tissue in rats. And what we know is as you're exercising, part of what causes that burn is there's a shift in pH or a shift in the acidity around the muscle tissue because you have an accumulation of metabolites and byproducts. Well, by different mechanisms, the reduction in pH, in, in other words, that, that increase in acidity and the presence of catecholamines by different independent mechanisms, these two things actually have additive protective effects for the muscle tissue in the, in light of changing pH. So it's possible. <laughs> And again, this is a study on rats. So with a big grain of salt, but this might be a mechanism by which catecholamines have a protective effect during exercise when that pH is shifting. So the answer to that question, does it help buffer the burn? Maybe. And if so, it would be an indirect effect. 
And then are its benefits more related to focus? So we've already said it, it can affect visual acuity. So definitely that can be beneficial in a bike race, let's be honest. Um, but there's other separate research that suggests that adrenaline helps with mental tasks. So it can actually help you improve mental tasks. And one of the interesting things about one of the studies I looked at on this is that fitness itself may help increase mental performance when you're under the influence of adrenaline. So the fitter you are when you have an adrenaline rush, the better able you are to perform mental tasks. Pretty cool. But um, all of this is to say that adrenaline is very, very helpful to performance. And we talk about sympathetic activation. Remember, it's not a switch is on or off. This is a matter of degree. So some of that sympathetic activation can be really good. And then you get a little bit too much and it kind of floods the system and it can be a little bit counterproductive. But for the most part, we see some really, really nice benefits to those catecholamines and the body obviously is pretty smart about this too, because the harder you work, the more you see those catecholamines circulating in the blood and doing their job to help you do all of these cool things. I have, I have a bunch of thoughts on this that, that I want to, <laughs> and also questions. Um, so, uh, <laughs> first of all, I, 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 at least from what I'm observing in, in raising a child with our son, I'm recognizing that a person can de like you, you have to build a relationship with adrenaline. I feel like over time, uh -huh. <laughs> if you, if you aren't exposed to it regularly, then it feels like so many different things. And, and we've talked about this before on the podcast, but when I feel adrenaline and when I feel those pre-race nerves and everything else, and I'm getting to the line of the race, I think I've, I've had so many racing opportunities in different contexts in my life. And Amber, probably even more so for you because swimmers just race so much and you did that for so many years. And then of course, being a professional bike racer too. But when I feel that I, I know that I look at that very differently than, um, than, than many people, uh, particularly I'll just say in this case, like specifically the N equals one example of like my son, he feels that before anything like that. And he's like terrified and, and nervous and scared, right? Because they're not used to feeling that. But I've, I also see that in adults too. And, and in a lot of us, like if it's a really big event, when we start to have an increase in adrenaline release throughout our body, it can cause us to feel plenty of different things like that. And that can have a profound effect on race day, like changing expectations, making you doubt the plan that you have, that, <laughs> that you've planned out really well, and that you're not going to oh, stick yeah. to it at all. Instead, you're just going to throw caution to the wind. Um, there's so many things. So like, it's really interesting to find out the actual physical effects that adrenaline has on performance. But then on the psychological side, I think managing the reaction or the feeling of adrenaline, I think is a really important thing for racers to be able to have. For mm -hmm. me, I guess it's just come along with more practice, but, um, Nate, I, I don't know, like, have you noticed that evolve when you went through your cat five to cat one attempt of just going through in such like a highly concentrated period of time? Did you look at pre-race nerves? differently and beginning to end or feel them differently at all? Did it change for you in that process? My headphones went out in the middle of that, but I oh, think no. you're talking about nerves and cat five. Uh, no, pretty scared each time. Like <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's fine. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, once I get into the race, I'm fine. But the start, uh, at the start line, there's always a, I don't, uh, I don't get nervous about hard efforts or hard races, even Leadville. I don't think I was very scared, but if the danger level. That's the part mm. that scares me. And to me, crits have a much higher danger level than something like Leadville. So that then jacks up my anxiety. Uh, and then if there's a near crash in the race, whew, then it's, but then I get the adrenaline and I just, uh, <laughs> yeah, attack or something like that. <laughs> I think that this goes back. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, please. Oh, I was just gonna say, I think this goes back to a little bit what Chad was talking about in terms of the familiarization with particular stressors. And this mm -hmm. is a classic example of this, right? So you can have the sensation of the adrenaline, and then you can have how you feel about the sensation of the adrenaline. And those are two different things. And so mm -hmm. if you get used to feeling the sensation of the adrenaline, that's just, the sensation itself won't change. But if you've felt it often enough, you might realize I don't need to feel anxiety about those sensations. I can say, oh, that's the sensation again. I've had that sensation before. I know I'm going to be okay. And so you, over time, you eliminate the, the layer of anxiety that's on top of the sensation and you're able to, to, to separate those things a little bit better. Yeah. Nate. I don't know if this is true, 
if I'm going to say it. I heard this on TikTok, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I like this idea. I like We're going to have to add a new section to like our references at the end. It'll be like TikToks. a bibliography of studies and then TikTok. Not only, not only do I not have science to support this, but I heard it on TikTok. <laughs> no, there's a lot of great people on TikTok saying great things and sure. uh, just like saying, I don't know. Back yeah, in sure. the nineties, you could say, I heard on the internet. Now I bet you get all your information that comes <laughs> via the internet in some yeah. way, because there are great For people sure. in it. Um, yep. the idea is, uh, the feeling of being nervous and excited that arousal state is the same, like the same things happen in your body. And the, there's research done where if people who were nervous, if outside, if out loud, they said, I'm excited, I'm excited, I'm excited. They actually felt better and it reduced mm -hmm. their anxiety and they switched more to an excited state. Uh, so I, it's a very easy thing to do and maybe it's all placebo, but, uh, and I, mean, I guess it is, but if you are in that state to say, Hey, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited before a race. I'm excited. And it kind of switches mm -hmm. your mindset of like, this well, is why I'm feeling amped as I'm excited. <laughs> There's a distinction between placebo and psychological too. I mean, you're describing a psychological effect. That's not placebo. Well, I think that's very real. It's the same what, what, placebo is psychological. Okay, sure. We could. Yep. However, whatever. I, I found it really interesting that what you described <laughs> is exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite <laughs> of how I feel. So when you line up for a crit, you're nervous. But when you were at Leadville, you weren't nervous. That would be just the opposite for me because uh -huh. I find uh, some, some form of comfort in crits. They're, they're proximate. I know emergency services are always nearby. Uh, sometimes I can ride to the course. I mean, there's just, there's no threat there. So I just line up and I'm as cool as a cucumber. But if I go out to something like Leadville, where I'm gonna be at some point 50 miles away from civilization, I would be full of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Part well, it's of it- that we're Oh, go ahead, John. That's sorry. I was going to say that I, I feel, uh, this is honest, honesty, no judgment zone, everybody, everybody listen mm -hmm. to this, all Safe the many, space. many, many, many thousands of people don't judge me for this, but, uh, don't attack me when you're in a race for this. But I, I find that, um, and I don't know if it's because I blunted this like response for years, right. Racing dirt bikes and everything else, but I don't have any fear in terms of danger but I do absolutely have fear in terms of anticipating the enormity of an effort. Like mm -hmm. if it really is. So like, I get that absolutely before a big workout, like a really tough one. When I look on adaptive training and it says like stretch or breakthrough, like I know that's going to be hard. And I get absolute nerves that I don't even get before a race. It's like a different, I, or perhaps just, I perceive it differently. Like what Amber was saying. Right. But it's definitely something that if you're listening to this, you may, have a number of different, I guess, uh, inputs that are causing you to feel this way. But I do believe that perception, you, you can kind of influence that perception and shift it. And it's profoundly helpful, I find. And, and, and I've actually kind of built in this response when I feel that. I like double down on focus. And everybody knows this, Nate's mentioned this before, but like race Jonathan, if I'm like on the line or getting ready for a race, I don't talk and I don't want to talk. talk. <laughs> Just don't do it. Um, <laughs> because I, he won't. That, <laughs> that's my reaction is when mm -hmm. I feel that I start doubling down on focus. And, and I, and I do feel that that actually helps me perform better. Uh, because I, I feel like it kind of drives me to a, a higher performing state, but it's really interesting to hear that all, you know, that all of us have these different uh, perspectives on it. Amber, you were going to say something. I have two thoughts. One, I want to follow up on what you just said, because I think that that's an important point. So for you, it's not matter the danger that part of the equation to you doesn't register as a threat because your perception probably coming from a dirt bike background is your, your skill level is at a point where you feel very much in control of that risk assessment, right? The, the, the mm -hmm. risk to you is not as high. So your perception of that specific kind of danger as a threat is going to be very different than someone else's. And I can say that for me, that my perception of threat in terms of the danger of a bike race shifted a lot over the course of my career. Like it was very, very high in the beginning and very, very low at the end, because once I got to a point where I had that confidence in my skill set, I really felt like I could handle anything that came at me. Um, 
but I had other, there were other threats, right? Like more kind of existential threats. Like what if I fail today? What if somebody attacks and I can't mm -hmm. cover that break? Like those were the things that really, to me felt like those were the, the things that I perceived as threats. And really our sympathetic response has more to do with what we perceive as a threat than what is actually a threat. Cause it's not a very, it's a very primitive system. This is why you might jump when you see a garden hose thinking it's a snake. It's because there's no, the, the system is designed to react really quickly and without a lot of thought process or rational, logical application, it's just, it's there. Um, so I think perception of threat is a really important ingredient here. But it's interesting that we were talking about anxiety because the, the study that I was looking at that was talking specifically about the mental tasks, performance of mental tax, tasks under the influence of adrenaline was also looking at anxiety. And so they were looking at the baseline um, state of anxiety for all of the subjects before they did the, uh, they applied either placebo or adrenaline and then looked at these mental tasks. And they found that without the adrenaline, uh, uh, anxiety was the higher the anxiety, the worse the person performed on the mental tasks. But as soon as adrenaline came into the equation, anxiety made no difference anymore, but fitness did. So in the presence of adrenaline, the detrimental effects of anxiety were actually lowered and the beneficial effects of fitness were enhanced, which is pretty cool and good news for those of us athletes out there who, uh, who do deal with anxiety. So something to think about, just an interesting kind of side note. Hmm. Super fascinating discussion on this. Um, are we ready to roll into some rapid fire? Nate, do you have something? Yeah, we forgot something. <laughs> the polarized okay. plans. We didn't do an update on that. Oh goodness. Uh, that's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> whoops. Uh, John, I, I mean, I sure. For, I think we can get them out tomorrow. Yeah. That's, that's the, I hate I, getting I'm, timelines. You can just hear it. Like people so you need timelines and I just hate it, but hopefully tomorrow, if not that we will try next week, but hopefully tomorrow. So Friday, I'm, March 19th, hopefully. I'm confident that we can get the, the plans, uh, based on the feedback that we re recently got on the forum and a lot of other things we wanted to involve people in the creation process of that. We've, we did a huge amount of work on the front end and, and obviously research. And as you can see in the past podcast, <laughs> a lot of research on it as well. Um, but then we got some more feedback from the forum to be able to add yeah. to that. So I'm uh, confident we can get them done, but th there's a difference right. really quick between getting the plans done and then getting them shipped. Because as Nate said, like, you know, that there's one small thing can end up being a big thing, uh, with tech stuff. So the issue we're having too, is that, uh, as we mentioned before, polarized means a lot of different things to different people. And these aren't like, we're trying to be very uh, strict in what Siler has said as a polarized plan. And then at different volume levels too, he hasn't really defined all of those things. And it, he hasn't ever laid out what a plan is, just kind of like parts. And sometimes they're a little conflicting. So we put this in the forum and one thing's clear is that everyone thinks it's something different. <laughs> there are many, uh, many, uh, people who, uh, they're arguing, you know, dip for different things. So anyways, we're trying to reconcile all those and really point to specific instances, either through research or what Siler says publicly about what he wants in a polarized plan and not do the, well, he said this about this other type of training and this about polarized, so we can make a leap into this other thing, really mm -hmm. trying to be very strict, get that very clear signal about, um, and so that's, uh, there's a, I don't know. I hope you hear what I'm saying. I'm not communicating this very well, but that is yeah, what I... we're trying to do. Go ahead, John, you yeah, have communications. <laughs> <laughs> I want, yeah. The, the, the point is what we really want to do here is discover what a, a traditionally polarized plan, how that performs that framework, how that performs at these different volumes that we already have data on for those specific volumes. This also is a good point to mention that these are like version one, and we're actually we're, we're labeling these plans as experimental. And the reason for that is because of the fact that they're still, we consider these still in their beta phase of development. And as we get more data, we will iterate upon them, perhaps add more plans, perhaps adjust the ones that are currently existing. That's what's what we do here is we, we commit to constant improvement. Um, so when we put something out, we continue to iterate upon it. So what this really is going to give us a great benchmark is to answer a lot of the questions that have existed with Polarize, like, does it work on low volume? And when we say low volume, we mean like 
the, tr- the low volume athletes that we see pick a ton of training plans and follow them between three and a half and five hours a week of training. Right. So does it work on that? Does it work when you scale it up? How does that change all that stuff? So it's going to be great. And you'll, when these plans do ship, you'll have access to them. You'll go to the uh, early access area of your account on trainer road. And then you'll see a little toggle switch that you can flip that will say experimental training plans or experimental access. You'll be able to flip that over and then you'll be able to find the polarized training plans. At first plan builder, isn't going to use these and put them into your, uh, like build them into your build for whatever event you have, but you'll be able to swap them in, drop them onto your calendar and swap out base and build blocks with these that you already have on your calendar with that as well. So, uh, it's exciting. And you know, in the future, We anticipate serving all sorts of different methodologies or different opportunities to be able to improve a person's fitness and collecting data on all of those. So then we can optimize that and find out how to best make you faster. So super exciting stuff. Um, thanks for, thanks for bringing that up, Nate. Uh, let's go into rapid fire. Emmett says, what is your best response to abuse from a driver? This one's, uh, it's a lot of, I think, (laughs) I think everybody deals with this. Why do you say that, Nate? That's a good one. to Because it's an adding to the antagonization between drivers and cyclists. The best thing is just to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The the flipping off, the yelling, the name calling, it just escalates it. And two in America, like you never know who's going to be that (laughs) that crazy person who comes out and comes after you. And this, you've seen videos, this happens. I think Mm -hmm. I've seen some in Australia too, but... It's not worth it to try to make this person feel bad. And in general too, there's an idea of like, just be kind because you make that person feel bad. They're then mean to their dog or their kid. And it just goes on and on. So Mm -hmm. just take it and, and, and try to be nothing you say is going to make that person go, oh, you're right. I should have done that differently. (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. in the moment as they honked at you or something like that. So I say no response. Yeah. One thing I've found that actually has been really helpful is proactively. So I have a Garmin Varia radar. I love that thing and I won't ride without it. Um, thank you, Nate, for turning me onto that, by the way. Uh, love it. But when I'm using that thing and I see a car is coming, I actually proactively like wave when they're coming. And I swear it's like, there is a correlation between that and getting a better, you know, people give me more room. I even see people wave as well. Who knows? Maybe my silly little wave actually made their day a little bit better. Right. So like it's better. Yeah. instead of having a bad reaction, you know, it just makes it better. And in the end, like, if you really like, if you're fighting this internally and you're thinking about it, just remember how silly you really look because you're a grown human riding around in spandex, basically a leotard, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you can't look tough. It's impossible. So even though you may Don't feel tough leotards. inside, <laughs> are Sorry. coming back. <laughs> Good point, Amber. Good point. But yeah, I completely agree with Nate and all of us listening to this podcast, we can probably be, um, we can be like, it's a significant number of people listening to this right now. So we could actually have a a net positive impact. Like, right. If we all just decide to be, you know, kind, uh, in those situations. So I'm with you, Jonathan, I wave at people in like very insistently and almost awkward, well, definitely awkwardly until I get their attention. Cause at some point, if you're waving hard enough and obviously enough, it becomes awkward for them not to wave back. And (laughs) for me, it's a safety thing. Cause I know if they wave back, they've seen me and they're physically acknowledging my presence. And, and once you do that, I feel like there's a lot less risk of them doing something, you know, that's going to put me at risk. Um, but if there's a situation where I don't see the car coming and they happen to pass close, um, or somebody yells at me or honks at me, I act like whatever thing that they just did was, was meant in friendliness. Like the honk was definitely friendly. That yelled expletive was definitely friendly. Go Amber, and I go just Amber. respond, <laughs> I just respond as if, as if it was like a really nice, like, Oh, Hey, yeah. Hi, how are you doing? Have a great day. And just, you know, if, if they think like, what an idiot, I was just cussing at her, you know, whatever it's, I, I'm not going to escalate the situation. And Chances are, I mean, there are frequently times where drivers just make mistakes and they feel bad and they didn't mean to. And if you respond in a, just like a neutral, friendly way, you know, they're not going to, you don't escalate a situation. Um, and I think that just generally it's nice if you can, the more good interactions you can accumulate between bikes, cyclists and motorists, or let's, let's change the wording on that between people on bikes and people in cars, Mm. the better for everyone. I, before you go, Chad, I had a situation where 
it was like at a light and I pulled ahead of a cyclist and I wasn't even close and I went around them. I was like so careful. I'm, I'm actually a cyclist and they, uh, they stopped and started yelling at me, like, uh, just berating me. And I wasn't even close to this person. I'm not sure exactly what I was, was doing. I'm like, I, I was thinking to my side, like I'm your people. And I was watching them and trying to do it. And I'm, I was like, man, cyclists suck. Like thinking <laughs> about somebody yelling at me like that. Another tip with the Varia, if, so you take like, you know, could be a few feet out from the, from the, the white line, if there's no, uh, shoulder. And then when you see somebody coming up behind you, you raise your hand and you pull over, uh, like you go, you ride on that white line and you like wave, like you're giving room to them. Mm -hmm. People come by me on Geiger. I've had mm -hmm. people go great job cyclists. Like, thank you. They just, yeah. they just want to be they're They're okay. Sharing the road. They, uh, and usually we don't know when someone's coming up behind us, but with that you do, and you giving yeah. that little extra effort to them, they passed me like slowly and they actually went way over on the left, you know, gave me the thumbs up. And it was just like this, this symbi symbi or symbiotic, <laughs> not some kumbaya There's a moment, moment of love going up <laughs> the road. <laughs> kumbaya, right? It was like, yeah. this is amazing. And uh, if you don't do that on Geiger Gray, you can get yelled at sometimes. Uh, you probably sure. happened to all, all of us here. Yeah. Chad, absolutely. what about you? Uh, so I, I agree almost hundred percent in that kindness is the right response. Uh, so, so my, my default emotion is anger. Uh, you might not know to sure. look at me and you might not have picked up on it unless you <laughs> we know, know me a little more closely. You guys all know. You watch beers with Chad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, alcohol changes things, but so, so I typically have to dial things back down from how I initially want to react. And, and this has forced me over the years to recognize that if I approach a situation instead of allowing myself to give into that default emotion and instead and, and amber's brought this up a lot so every time she says it it kind of hits home with me to approach it with curiosity i end up everyone ends up coming out better because of it so in the case of someone doing something rude to me or honking at me or yelling whatever i ask myself huh i wonder wonder why why that is why would they act that way why would they do that and i come up with all sorts of good answers they probably didn't see me they didn't realize how closely they were passing they yelled at me because someone probably flipped them off the last time, uh, whatever. There's probably a good reason for this. And it's because of that that led to this very question because I know the rest of this question and I can't share it because I got to keep it G rated here, but I made a suggestion to a motorist and that motorist <laughs> laughed, laughed with me. And it was meant, it, it was meant to be humorous. And the motorist thought about it for a second and then said, you're probably right. And, and we all went on about our way, happy as can be. <laughs> So if you're going to say anything at all, and I do think Nate is on the, has the right answer, just don't acknowledge it, leave it alone. But if you're going to say something, be pleasant, be kind. Yeah. yeah. I will share, there was one incident where someone threw a bottle at my head yeah. and from a moving car. And I think that people forget that when you're in a moving car, you have a very high baseline velocity. Um, so I actually followed them to where they were going and very kindly and courteously just said, you know, Hey, I know that you probably didn't mean to physically harm me back there, but if that bottle had made contact with me, you got to keep it. Cause this is a, it was a car full of really young kids. And so I think that they just forget that, you know, you throw a, a bottle at five miles an hour out of a moving car that's going 30 miles an hour. I mean, that's, you know, gonna mm -hmm. have a really strong impact so i literally i just brought it up to him very kindly not accusatory not blaming just hey i get you were just trying to have fun and make a joke but you know keep in mind that this is keep in mind the physics of the situation basically mm -hmm. and they were actually i think you know once once you break down that kind of mob mentality where you're anonymous and they're anonymous and they realize like oh this is a person i mean they were actually very apologetic and kind and i just i hope that from that they'll take that forward to like oh yeah actually we could seriously injure or potentially kill somebody if you're going you know 40 50 miles an hour in, in a car um so mm -hmm. that was actually a really positive experience and and in that case i'm glad that i didn't ignore it because i just felt like they're just going to keep doing that if they don't realize how much of a risk that they're putting people at in that case so i don't know amber gave him a deep dive deep dive on physics, <laughs> the stop physics. <laughs> <laughs> I, so get ready get ready to drink on this one but um so i've uh, one perk for everybody here if you're in the united states oh actually first i'm sure that um you're familiar if you're listening to this there's a term called roll coal and really it comes around from from guys in big diesel trucks guys and gals i guess in big diesel trucks and what they'll do is they'll 
they'll ease off the throttle for a little bit and have their truck tuned just so, so that then when they hammer back on the throttle, it throws a bunch of black soot, um, all over the road and all over. And like, we are like a moving target for them. So that's very entertaining, uh, for, for them to want to try to spray. Um, it's not great. It's very bad. But, uh, and, and if we get angry in that moment, just remember how silly it looks. So, um, but Keegan has mentioned something that, uh, ever since he has been wearing his American, so for his, his U S national champs, Jersey, mm-hmm. the incidence of coal rolling has dropped significantly yes. because he is wearing an American flag. <laughs> so I can, perhaps there's some sort of correlation here. Um, I can attest I, to that. I, I want to, that's why I want to win a national championship actually. So, so I don't cool. have a national championship Jersey, but I do have a national team Jersey. And when I, there are certain areas where I train, where I would specifically wear my national team Jersey, which is all stars and stripes because exactly that there's a different psychology. Cause you see, there's just a psychology around it, right? Like, okay, she's in spandex and I don't like that, but patriotic. And then there's just a moment of hesitation. <laughs> and sometimes that moment of hesitation is, is spells the difference between like real risk and no risk. Um, so I, I hundred percent, I second that, that there, that is a real <laughs> thing. It's that shared connection. They start to see you more yep. as a human. They're like, Oh, yeah. I like America too. And then yeah. there's uh there's that shared connection and you're like, Hey, this person is, uh, is okay. Yep. Where if there's not that it's easy. It's just like when you pull up and you say, Hey, I'm a real person. I'm talking to you. They're suddenly like, Whoa. And Chad says something yeah. not mean. They're like, Whoa, you're right. Uh, that is funny. It's when you can, <laughs> it's people, when you dissociate them, right. And they're not really people. They're just like a, a cyclist. They're not a person. Uh, that's where yeah. people get in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. This has been a great conversation on this. Let's go into yeah, the next one. <clears throat> nice rapid fire. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Super rapid. <laughs> what do we call it this? <laughs> I don't know because of irony. Um, Danny, I believe is how you would pronounce your name. Uh, Danny, if you are Daniel and you forgot an L or something when you typed it in, I am sorry, but, um, says, is there a correct Q factor stance to my body type? What do bike manufacturers base their Q factor with on each of my bikes have different Q factor and stance. So, um, yes, there is likely an ideal Q factor for you. Go see a good bike fitter, uh, and, and to figure that out who is a good bike fitter and how to find one. We've talked about that almost impossible task on the, on the podcast plenty of times. It's tough to find, but ask around, start to figure out, go through the process of seeing different fitters and talking to them. But yes, each body does have a unique Q factor and that's why you can shift your cleats, uh, to the left or right on those shoes to be able to try to nail it. Alex wild. Actually, I'll mention this. Everybody should follow Alex on Instagram. He recently posted about this where he was trying to match his road Q factor to his mountain bike Q factor. Cause road has a 148 millimeter wide spindle, I believe. Whereas mountain bikes have 168, I believe. So they are different. I'm probably wrong on those numbers, but it's about that. So they're different. So then when you ride on your road bike, you're always a bit narrower than when you are riding on your mountain bike. So he added some washers and he did a bunch of stuff to be able to get to the point where his road bike matches for that very reason. So yes, absolutely. And, and it does make a difference. You'll notice that you'll have um, more stable pedaling. You'll have to focus less on that whole thing. Um, I know I'm sorry. I'm not giving you the exact answer, but that's the way to find it. And yes, there is an answer for you. So, uh, Milo says Jersey pocket distribution. What do you put in which pocket and how does this change when you add a vest or a jacket? I have like very specific answer for this one. (laughs) Nate looks like he's just could not be, (laughs) could not be interested less. There's not uh, many choices of like, I don't know. <laughs> I think John, John and I have a similar system, so it depends. So, so if it's a pretty short ride and I can fit all my, my food for the ride in one pocket, I have all of the food ready to eat in my right pocket and I take one out at a time and then I put the empty, the empty container in my left pocket and that's my system. So I know I need to empty my right pocket by the end of the ride in order to have fueled appropriately. So that it's a really easy kind of tactile way for me to keep track of how well I'm keeping up on my calorie intake and my fueling. Um, and then at a bike race, sometimes if it's a much longer ride, I need to put left and right pocket full of food, in which case the middle pocket becomes the trash receptacle. Um, but it is, it is a nice system for keeping track of making sure that you're on schedule for your fueling. Mm-hmm. For sure. That's exactly what I do. Then I put phone in middle pocket almost always. That's where, uh, unless I'm racing, phone's always in the middle pocket. And then on my vest, I have one vest that uh, doesn't fit quite as trim. So if it's like, if it's unzipped, even it, if I put heavy stuff in the pockets, it's annoying. So I'll shift everything to the Jersey when I'm wearing that. But otherwise I almost keep always, I keep my heavier objects in my vest 
So then when I have my vest unzipped, because that's my favorite way to ride vest unzipped, it's fantastic. Not very fast, but, um, when that's the case, I don't want it flying behind me like a cape. Um, I want it to be kind of weighted down somewhat. <laughs> Chad, how about you? And in, in trying to abide the spirit of rapid fire, I got phone in the phone in the right, tire repair in the middle, food on the left. If I'm wearing a vest, I just roll it up over my pockets. Oh, Chad has spoken. That. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for the <laughs> thanks for the like passive aggressive fire. Supposed thanks to for be. the passive aggressive jab on rapid fire there, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, in, in the next one from Kylie says a quick a quick but contemplative rapid fire question for all of you fantastic hosts that comes from one of Jonathan's recurring questions on the Successful Athletes podcast. What are you extraordinarily good at in the training and racing process, and what do you struggle with most? This could be anything. Think on that one. I'll go. Go ahead. Jim. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> when it comes to training, I'm good at short, punchy stuff and the longer sustained stuff is a weakness. And over time I've tried to steer back toward the weakness and improve it and it's happening. So yay for me, when it comes to racing, I like short events and, and, and long events freak me out for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> awesome. Uh, hey. I'll go. I think. I think in a crit, my success is I'm pretty good at not doing any work until I have to do a lot of work and trying to time it. And you can watch the videos. I don't always do it right. But I only say this because I've beat many people who have higher watt kgs or better physiology than me, like fitness. Um, but I'm not the best. So I guess that's relative to me and my fitness or to the people that I'm racing against. And then I'm bad at I'm trying to improve on this. But... Uh, if it's a weekend and I've got a ride scheduled, I'll like sit in my kit before I get on the bike mm -hmm. for way too long. Be like, what's going on with work? Do, do, do. <laughs> and kind of uh, get to push that out. Right. By the time, like I get on the bike, I could have been like, Oh, I'd be done by now if I just would have got on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's relatable for sure. Yeah. Amber, how about you? My strength and weakness are probably the same thing. And I would say it's problem solving. So I'm really good at this in training and racing. So in, in a race that's, that would look like race strategy, right? So what's the problem? The problem is this course doesn't suit me. How can I figure out a way of, you know, increasing my odds of winning the race, even if the course doesn't suit me and coming up with a strategy that will allow me to do that. Or in training, if there's something I'm really struggling with, um, like, I think I, I've shared the story before. I was really struggling with getting my VO2 max power up and really believing that I could, to, could do those intervals. And so the way I problem solved that was, okay, how can I remove as many layers of cognitive load to really focus on the physiologic process? And once I knew that once I could, I could complete the, complete the interval physiologically, that the belief in my belief and confidence would come back. And then I would be able to translate that to my more higher cognitive load situations. So I'm really good at the problem solving thing which is a strength until it's not, because then <laughs> the, the, the point at which this becomes a weakness is when you start looking for problems to solve, <laughs> and you, not everything is a problem that needs to be solved. So, um, this can, this, this can shift from a strength to a re weakness really quickly in terms of overthinking. So I would say that, um, mm. probably that that's a, that's probably a pretty good way of summing up my, my approach. <laughs> This, this is going to sound silly to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is going to sound silly, but I'm good at planning and then I'm bad at sticking to the plan. Um, but <laughs> I think I'm good at planning. Uh, I am able to get like a good fix on where I am at, where I should be, and then adjusting and setting expectations appropriately for that. And even planning out, I think that I'm, I'm good at being able to plan out things like nutrition strategies, everything else. Like, um, I'm, 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 I'm a structure sort of person and it works really well. So I think that that's a strength that really helps me in training and racing. But the thing that, uh, I'm worse at that I frustrate or that I, I struggle with most and I'm frustrated with in training is prioritization. When it comes down to it, I, I don't set clear enough priorities with myself a lot of the time. So then I end up jumbling those. Right. And then that means that things don't happen as I planned them to happen. So once again, strength and weakness is really frustrating. <laughs> and then in the racing side of things, um, I am a very intuitive person in a lot of ways, despite having the planning side, especially when we're out like on the course and I tend to trust instinct heavily. So as a result, I'm the sort of person that will absolutely take that detailed and carefully prepared plan and 
quickly audible from it. And in many times in <laughs> retrospect, I look back and I'm like, man, why did you do all that work to plan it when you just were going to throw it out the window? You should have stuck with it. But sometimes it's also been helpful, but finding that balance, um, is, is one thing that sticks out to me. So, okay. Would you rather number one? And this one's from Tyson. Would you rather be a lead out rider or a domestique? This one's particularly interesting for you, Amber. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think this is, this, the answer to this question is really different if you're in men's cycling versus women's cycling, because in women's cycling, our teams tend to be smaller. So if you're a domestique, you are also a lead out rider. <laughs> you <laughs> both are one and the same. And, and the reason for that is, is we just don't have as many people on a professional team. So you end up wearing many hats. Um, so we don't necessarily have like a, a dedicated lead out squad that's separate from the domestiques. So I'll just, I'll just take the easy way out here and say both. Um, this was my role, both were my role. And I loved, I loved both. Both, so <laughs> mm. what about, what about you, Chad? I lead out for sure. I'd, I'd much rather try to outrun my sprinter than carry bottles. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> like, I'm not helping anybody. <laughs> I, I just, my, my sprinter has to earn it. Sprint can't come around a lead out then. Well, who should be leading out? <laughs> oh, so Chad really is saying he wants to be a sprinter and I also <laughs> don't want to be on Chad's team. <laughs> uh, Nate, I like you? to be a lead out rider because one domest, uh, domestic has to work so hard the whole time. Hmm. And if you have the idea of, I want to be fresh till the end, plus the lead out, if you're a good lead out reader, writer, that's like the least likely to crash. You got to crash yourself. You're at the hmm. front of the race. You're just pegging it. And then when it's time you drift back. And you get to like share in the success that, and you only work for like, I don't know, one to five minutes, somewhere in there, depending Some on lead how out rider is to the end. A lead get, out rider is penning an angry email to you right now. <laughs> a what is? <laughs> a lead out rider is like typing an angry no, no. email. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not easy. I'm just saying it's way better than being like a, a five hour domestique, uh, over a stage rate or you know what I mean? Over a, a grand tour. That sounds really hard. Amber, what were you saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, even being a lead out rider, it's really hard because unlike the sprinter, you're not getting an armchair ride to the finish. You still, I mean, you're not the protected rider. So you actually have to do more work in order to make it to the finish. And then you don't just get to the front and have well, clean air. You've got to thread the needle and do a, a lot of work even to get there. And that's assuming that you even get to the front because a lot of really, mm. really good lead out riders are the ones who can thread the needle and stay in the draft for a really long time until the very last second. So I don't that know. That sounds fun. <laughs> I, I beg to Domestique differ. <laughs> is just pure work, pure hard work for like it's the whole so time. Much tactical work though. It's real. I, I don't know. I love it. I, I'm really good to get into the front at like four laps to go when no one's like really caring. <laughs> <laughs> I could get there and just go. But, uh, uh, so I don't, maybe it's to my size. I would, I'd love to be a, I would love to be on a P one, two team and just be a lead out rider and just mm -hmm. go hard for two laps at the end and keep the speed as high as we can, as you know, as we can. That sounds fun. It is I, I'd rather be a domestique than a lead out rider, I think. So I, I just, um, I think it fits my, my, so if we're applying our individual fitness profiles, I like that better. I don't think I'm the best lead out. Um, even though I've led Nate out a few times on our YouTube videos, uh, that's also just Nate and I racing in local fields. You know what I mean? So that's you like, could be bigger. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't think I'd make that good of like, I'm, I'm, I'm good at threading the needle and all that stuff, but I'd just rather be a domestique. I think, um, it'd be fun to, and I think Amber, I can understand why you really enjoyed it because you're problem solving for the entire team and you're kind of thinking mm -hmm. up all these different things and doing it all the time. I can see how that would the tickle the nerd nerve for Amber for sure. <laughs> totally. um, <laughs> now, would you rather be a sprinter or a climber is the next one. <clears throat> climber. Sprinter. Too many crashes and sprints. Climber for sure. Yeah, but if you're a sprinter, you win races. Sprinter. Climbers rarely win compared sprinter to sprinters. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this I guess is one of those things. I think... a pro versus uh like lo locally i'd rather have a huge sprint than be a good primer climber because then you would like there's mm -hmm. climbers don't win any races around here there's like two road races yeah, a year like... where climbers win yeah 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 it's a good point i think most people view climbing as more difficult than sprinting which is a bit of a misnomer but we'll you know letting that go for a second so I think a lot of people kind of romanticize being a good climber because it is one of those things that's notoriously difficult and having climbing be one of the things that felt more challenging for me relative to other skills on the bike. It's, it's tempting to say that I'd, I'd rather be a climber, but if I'm being mm. serious, winning races is a lot of fun. And then, um, 
so I would pick sprinter. <laughs> hmm. Chad, you'd rather be a sprinter, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I really enjoy both. I, I, and I like yeah. trying to be good at both, but sprinting is far more exciting. Yeah. If I can still do other formats of racing, I will pick a sprinter because yes, sprinter, or sorry, I'll pick a climber because <laughs> sprinters win a whole lot more climbers rarely win. So I'd still want chances to win races, <laughs> but if I am just doing road racing, then yeah, I'll pick a sprinter, but there's, there is a great feeling about when you are, uh, climbing well, and you feel like you can accelerate against grades that usually stop you from mm -hmm. accelerating. Ooh, that's just a great feeling. That's like, uh, yeah, I love that feeling. So I feel like the um, climbs are like a low speed chase though. And they're just not as exciting. As yeah. Those yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> yeah. It just like, it really depends. Away. <laughs> it, yeah. <laughs> it depends on the era of cycling. I would say uh, the climbs used to have some pretty explosive action yeah, on them, but not quite good, as much these point. days anymore. It, do so. it depends on the type days. of climb. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Actually, just recently, even this year, we've had some, we've seen some really cool, exciting racing on, on the yeah. climb. So thanks Annie Os for trying to rebrand re yourselves. Um, all right. Last one. Would you rather be a GC contender or a one day classics contender? Classics. This is pro, right? If we're pro. pros. Pro. Yeah. Yep. Classic. Classics. Classics. For sure. Across the board. Classics. Oh yeah. Who in the world would want to ride a grand tour <laughs> like, <laughs> three weeks? Like, oh, oh my gosh. And then like, it's probably going to come down to the time trial, which I absolutely hate too. Oh gosh. It'd be terrible. So and the right. pressure, Ma it's, oh it's like the, you have to be good for 27 or 21 days. I mean, uh, yes. the whole time and in classics, like you have a bad day. Oh, there's, there's another race. There's another race. And you can just keep sometimes doing even, it. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes On even the, other the next hand. day. I mean, yeah. I'm already picking classics, but on the other hand, there's a lot of room in a stage race to make up for mistakes. So you could have a bad one to even three days. And if it's a 10 or 12 day stage race, you can come back from that. So but like there is the a flip France, side to it. It's usually not right. It's people are so dialed that if you have one bad day and there's so many good people that it's, it's unlikely to come it's back usually from it. one bad day. Yeah. This is one of those yeah. big differences between men's and women's cycling too, because a lot of the women's, uh, the, the women's stage races have really hefty time bonus sprints, mid-stage time bonus sprints. And I've seen a lot of, it gets really exciting because you have the climbers who are relying on putting in time gaps on the climbs or time trials and putting time tr um, gaps on the time trials. But then you have all these time bonuses. And so you see the mm -hmm. GC contenders, the climbers and the time trialists having to engage in these, you know, three, four mid-race sprints every stage. And I have seen a lot of stage races be won purely on the the mid-race time bonus sprints. So mm. I I think um yeah, I think it can be really exciting in in a different way. But that's that's a another quirk of the women's side of the sport. We rarely talk about pro racing on this podcast, and I don't know if it's just distance making the heart grow fonder here, but <laughs> this year, the racing has been so good. I don't know if anybody else agrees, but it's been fantastic so far. I don't know if it's because we had a lack of racing last year, relatively speaking, but holy cow, the racing has just been so fun to watch men's and women's. It's been incredible so far. So, okay, let's get into Jay's question. He says, thanks for a tremendous podcast, uh, product and podcast together. They've created and grow my love for cycling. Mm -hmm. Help me increase my power aside from a recent injury. He notes and improve my physical fitness. Awesome. Good to hear. Love he says, my that. question for you may be esoteric, but I think it is very interesting. I'm a surgeon. And during my medical training, I noticed that my pre perceived performance in the operating room seem to vary slightly based on cycling workouts I completed early in the morning. <laughs> a little disconcerting right there. <laughs> so, I was uh, going to say, I'm, I'm going to start asking my surgeon about his workout schedule. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> gave away my best joke, Amber. <laughs> oh, oh <laughs> man. Sorry, Chad. Oh, no. Uh, so, uh, Let's, say it, workout... Chad. Let's forget he's, she said that. Yeah. Let's hear it, Chad. <laughs> and in black pen, we're all starting fresh. Um, workouts consistently seem to enhance focus, though I started to notice diminishing returns with more intensity and VO2 max work probably was too tiring, particularly for long cases. So I'm curious about your experience and if you're aware of studies looking at mental or physical performance following cycling workouts, uh, Chad, take it away. Okay. So I'm going to try to get through this in 10 minutes or less so that we have time for live questions. Uh, first off, can't promise it'll happen. I'll try. First off, <laughs> I want to point out two things. You say your question may be esoteric. It's absolutely not. This applies to everybody. I mean, this is, this is very general. And secondly, you're a surgeon. <laughs> We're going to keep coming back to that because <laughs> your profession, it's made me approach this question a little differently than say, are you, you're a cycling coach or something. 
Okay, so let's start with personally, uh, I've recognized over time that even pre-podcast, I need to be a little mentally sharper on podcast days than most days. So I, I don't do hard workouts pre-podcast. I save them for after. Anecdotally, my fiance is a, a veterinarian, but she has surgery days, specific surgery days. We recognize the same things with her. She needed to be sharp on her surgery days. So we tabled those hard workouts for different days. And then we've all seen this. We've probably all been there. Bike racers on Mondays are next to worthless. If they get any work done, it's not of the highest quality. So if you have a hard training weekend or a hard race weekend, you come in, your brain is just not in the game. So all of that kind of points to where I'm going here. So let's look at what's actually been demonstrated in the research. One study regarding brain plasticity said that exercise modulates genes that bring about structural and functional changes in the brain. And I've linked to that study because it's just an interesting read. I'm going to be very surface regarding uh, the, the findings, but it's titled Effects of Physical Exercise on Cognitive Functioning and Well-Being, Biological and Psychological Benefits. If that title is interesting to you, the paper will be very interesting. Give it a read. But one of the things that comes out of it is they discuss epigenetic manifestations. And we've talked about epigenetics before, how we can influence our genetic outcomes. So this is one of the ways where we can literally control gene expression. We can decide how our genetics manifest, right? Via epigenetic. And anyway, the paper also pointed out that uh, exercise conveys benefits to cognitive function and well-being. So on the cognitive side, we're talking about our intellectual functioning on the well-being side, more of the emotional side of things. And then, and this is chronically, but let's look, since the question is more about immediacy, let's look at on the, the acute side. So <clears throat> since mental exertion impacts physical performance, and we've seen studies uh, demonstrating as much for for years, if not decades by now. Uh, 2009, Sam Marcora looked at mental fatigue and how it limits exercise tolerance. Uh, jump forward about 10 years, Perez looked at uh, how in, in the case of recreational athletes, mental fatigue impaired their performance, altered their brain activity. They had a faster increase in uh, rating of perceived exertion, uh, shorter time to exhaustion. And notice some of this overlaps with the, the sleep restriction we were talking about earlier. So I want to go out a limb here, out on a limb here, and say that I think it's reasonably safe to assume that vice versa holds true that physical exertion can exert an influence on mental performance, and there is evidence to support this. And encouragingly, there's also evidence to support that it's trainable to some extent. Hmm. One study in particular looked at elites and noted how they're better at mitigating this decline via what they termed a narrowed focus. More specifically, they they, they called it a suppression of irrelevant information. So basically they improve their inhibitory control, which is how we cognitively self-regulate our own behavior. They decided what was important, what they needed to process, what they needed to tune out. And because of it, you know, they perform better. And over time through practice, habituation, familiarity, they got better at suppressing this irrelevant information. So yeah, my that, point here, that, sorry, once that sounds like Amber to me, right? Like <laughs> for Amber, sure riding in a group of a pro Peloton, you've mentioned that in the beginning, it was like, oh my gosh, overload. And then over time, <laughs> you started to filter signal and noise and you were able to do that. It's so cool just to yeah. see a study that parallels that experience. Any, any yeah. elite level athlete that has to function in that close proximity at those speeds, navigating road furniture. And I mean, just the, the impossible to predict actions of, you know, some hundred other writers. I mean, you have to decide what you can focus on and what you have to close off. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mental yeah. triage. Okay. <laughs> You're really good at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a, that's a perfect term. Okay. So my point here is that endurance competitions and workouts to, to a similar extent require this inhibition of adverse feelings. And they, and they point to dyspnea, which is, you know, difficulty breathing, or just some, some breathing challenge, muscle pain and thermal discomfort. These are all things we face every time we, we hop on the bike, unless of course it's an easy ride. But every time we, we get on the bike to do something productive, this is part and parcel. And we also have to continually manage this urge to quit. And this requires a, a persistent conscious resistance to giving in to an urge that just escalates over the course of a workout. So that, that's a heck of a lot of brain power being steered at just tolerating discomfort. So to put this another way, workouts are ongoing drains on our cognitive resources. And, and, and what's more, it only grows more challenging over the course of a workout, of a race, of a, of a training cycle. 
<clears throat> so now let's look at the consequences of, of cumul cumulative load. And I really didn't dig into research on this because I don't feel it's necessary to convey the point I want to make, which is that cumulative fatigues impacts are familiar. We've been through all of them. Nobody gets fresher as a week goes on. Nobody gets fresher as a loading cycle goes on, you know, unless it's taper or recovery, but that's not what we're talking about here. So my point is, is that where you are in your loading cycle is very likely to have an impact on your cognition. And then we can look at things as simple as dehydration. So cognitive and mental performance is degraded by dehydration. And I linked to a study that demonstrates this exact thing and hyperthermia as well. And these two, these two things go hand in hand, especially in an indoor environment, especially in an indoor environment where insufficient cooling is, is, a, is an issue. So dehydrate, and, and we've pointed out in the past that dehydration can also be linked to that orthostatic hypertension we've talked about. So where, where blood pressure is low, you stand up, you get a little lightheaded, worst case you faint, you know, syncope, probably not something you want your surgeon to experience at any point <laughs> in an operation. So takeaway here is hydrate pre, during, post, cool, perhaps pre, certainly during a, an event outdoors in hot conditions, maybe that's a benefit, probably not during a, a morning workout. And then of course, cool during and post, that's a, that's a big deal and it can affect exert, uh, mental uh, cognition. And then if we look at <clears throat> mental exertion during exercise, there was a very recent study that uh, pretty interesting. They, they had a group that was uh, the mental exertion group, a movie group and a control group. So they all had to ride at 65% of their peak power output. So imagine doing a ramp test, working at 65% of that highest value to exhaustion. And then at another time they had to ride at that 65% for 45 minutes. All the while, the mental exertion group was doing a Stroop test, the movie group <laughs> watching the movie, control group wasn't doing anything. And if, you, if you're not familiar with the Stroop test, they basically, it's the color of the word. So they may write the word red, but it's in the color blue and you have to say what the color is. So even though you're looking at red, you're seeing blue, you just gotta get that right. So it takes a little bit of mental dexterity, right? And, and what they found was that both the rating of perceived exertion, their heart rate went up, time to exhaustion went down cortisol and prolactin, which were what they were using as markers of stress increased during mm -hmm. the mental exertion group. So, so what was going on in their head was actually affecting their physical capabilities, or at least their psychological ability to manage their physical capabilities. So my point here is that maybe table any of these in workout mental tasks just prior to operating on people. <laughs> suggestion or another suggestion, draw the line, decide on the days I have to operate. I don't do anything above sweet spot. Maybe mm -hmm. I don't do anything above tempo. Maybe I only ever do aerobic endurance rides. That if you're a my surgeon, yes, <laughs> only aerobic <laughs> endurance. That, that is the take here, by the way, Jay. I'm telling you. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, they, they have questioners for us. They have questioners for us. We should have questioners for them. And, and head, head, heading the list, how hard was your workout this morning? Are you a trainer road <laughs> subscriber? Did you do VO2 max work? Well, I, Chad, I am going to look up my surgeon's name uh, and then have AT magically change their workout. <laughs> the beta. Uh, hey, look, you just, uh, you got Give recovery a, day. Amazing. Appropriate. <laughs> Actually, you got a day off today. Tell them they got an FCP increase too. Just like good mood, like straight across the board. Right? Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> this is so cool. Cause we've talked about this before. Cognitive load is real and, and oh, your brain is real physically using energy, burning glucose. I mean, it's not just a passive activity of yep. thinking and focus here. This is, um, yes, it legit. It's legit. And we're going to talk about that very thing. I have three more points to make here and then I'll close out with something a little more encouraging. First off, <laughs> recognize the disparity in, in the external versus internal workloads. So, yeah. so we're super good at measuring work. You know, we have Watts, we have, we have power meters. So we have all these objective metrics, power, intensity, duration, volume, all these things that we can look at and know definitively this is what we did, but they don't always align with the physiological, or I'm sorry, the, the, the physiological doesn't always align with psychological tolls. So, and these metrics don't always align. Uh, I stated that poorly. Neither of these objective metrics align with what's going on physiologically, psychologically all the time. There can be disconnects at time. So an example would be a familiar workout that you're always good at, that you always nail for whatever reason, you couldn't do it as well today. Something else was going on. The numbers were there. So everything objectively stacked up, but subjectively something was a little off. 
And then got to consider that fatigue begets fatigue. And I linked to an interesting paper on that as well. And, and, and what it, we're talking about here is that incoming fatigue from other physical activities or other mental activities can actually increase your rating of perceived exertion, how hard the workout feels. And while RPE may not actually limit the work or the workout, it does require higher mental contribution. So this could lead to fewer cognitive resources at your disposal during, but in this case, post-workout. So the takeaway here is that you should probably consider scheduling your more fatiguing workouts accordingly, just like we've talked about already. If you need to be sharp, maybe don't do the hard stuff prior to you know whatever it is that's going to command your mental resources that day. And then finally, as Amber already mentioned, there's a nutritional component and we can just focus on one of them, which is, you know, brain glucose. And this applies both pre post and during because get any of those wrong and it can have effects post-workout. So if we accept that physical tasks exact a mental or cognitive toll, then we have to at least accept the possibility that exercise can impact brain function at least in that it depletes liver glycogen, which is going to have an impact on blood glucose, which is going to have an impact mm -hmm. on how well you can fuel your brain. And, and it's really hard not to recognize that very impact. Do a hard workout, don't nourish well, you're fuzzy afterwards. You don't think sharply, not something desirable in a surgeon who's about to, I don't know, at times <laughs> amputate a body part. <laughs> I mean, his left or my left? I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> Sorry, my workout was hard. <laughs> Can't say that. <laughs> okay, so takeaway there, pre, during, post workout nutrition is extremely important, especially for surgeons. And, and then again, note to self, always ask surgeon if they're a trainer road athlete. Okay, so. <laughs> I'll close out with a brighter side. And, and this is, this kind of brings this full circle because that first study talks about this as, as well. There are cognitive benefits of endurance and even strength exercise. So a study just a couple of years ago by Wu and Chang uh, looked at basically low ish intensity, either on the endurance side or the strength side, had them do a workout, rested them for 30 minutes, and then they tested brain function. And they actually used an electrode cap to look at response times, global and local switching. I don't know what that is, but it makes me sound smart. Accuracy, et cetera. And they found that there was an acute exercise facilitated cognitive performance each time. So there appears to be a line between exercise that helps and hinders cognitive performance. So your challenge, again, is to find where that line is for you and to time your training accordingly. Mm. Super interesting. I really wonder about... Um how that line changes with, with, for example, ADHD. So I used to mm. joke a lot that I used exercise as a coping mechanism for ADHD, even though I hadn't been diagnosed or anything like that. I just kind of joked that I felt like that. But then recently when I was concussed, I had a, a full battery neuropsych evaluation and they were like, oh yeah, those jokes about ADHD <laughs> you were making, that's actually true. <laughs> like you have that. <laughs> so it was, it was really interesting because I, I joked about it and really felt like a hard workout actually helped me more than an easy workout because an easy workout wasn't enough to tire my brain out to allow it to just narrow focus. Um, if I wasn't tired enough, my brain would still jump around and which sometimes is really fun because you make cool connections. But for really focused mental tasks like going to school and doing exams, I needed a really, really hard workout. So that line was in a really different place for me. And mm. I, I, I would be really interested to see how that changes uh, with things like ADHD. Nate, you're smiling. Perfect. You got something to say. I've got, I, no, I don't. <laughs> Okay. I, I always do, up. but I don't. <laughs> good, good. A man of restraint. That's the, <laughs> all right. So let's go into the next one. Uh, Ray says, uh, first off, great podcast. Love getting faster. And my question is many races are won or lost through a crazy all of Philippe style move one kilometer from the finish where on tired legs, you suddenly put in a sprint to get a gap on the group. And you then have to hold a lot of power that a lot of power down to stay in front of them all the way until the finish line. This might be a 200% effort followed by two or three minutes at like 130 or 140% FTP, something like that, and going deep into the red and try not to explode. So his question, what energy systems are used and how to best train these sort of moves? Mm. Amber. 
<laughs> you, well, you're the pro um, racer here. <laughs> the, the part that I want to dig into is, is not the specific energy systems, and, and uh, we can get into that. But I, I want to point out that these moves are usually successful, not only because of the fitness level of the athlete that's making the move, but primarily because of the tactics that are evolving in the group as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that, you know, in order to increase your odds of making a move like this work, yes, you need to be fit enough in order to execute the move. That's kind of your ticket to entry, but what's going to make the move successful is whether it's a tactically savvy move in context of what's happening in the race. Um, so this is a common, this, this move is commonly successful in fields where you have a big disparity in fitness. And that would be kind of beginner categories where people are coming into the sport at very different levels of fitness and experience. Um, those, that disparity kind of gets a little bit narrower as you, as you move up, move up in categories. But if you're coming into the finish with a smaller group and you don't have the whole Peloton, um, chances are it's a group of individuals. And so there's no teammates working for each other. So nobody in that group really wants to do the work of chasing down a move. That's an ideal tactical context to launch a move like this because nobody wants to do the work to chase. And if you're the first one to go, everyone's going to be looking at everyone else. Like you chase, no, you chase because they don't want to be the one to bridge the gap for someone else. Mm -hmm. So this is one of those rare times where being the first person to attack can actually be an advantage. Um, but again, this is all context dependent. So if you come to the finish and you're in a small group and there's two or three people on the same team, it's a very different scenario because now you have possibly one or two people who are willing to sacrifice themselves for their teammate. Uh, so it's really important to, to evaluate the tactical situation and the tactical component of this that's really important is the hesitation of the people who would chase you down. What are some ways that you can create a situation or a scenario that would enable that kind of hesitation? Well, element of surprise is one of them. So if you're coming into the finish in a smaller group that's been reduced throughout the race, positioning at the back of the group is really important because you can read everybody's body language. And if someone's about to go, you can read that and go with them. Or if you attack from the back of that smaller group, and again, don't attack from the back of like a group of 50 or 30 or even 20, that's probably not a good idea. But if you're coming in in a small group of less than 10 and you attack from the back of the group, by the time you enter someone's peripheral vision, you're already at top speed. So they then have to accelerate from a lower speed to match your speed and actually get faster than you in order to bridge that gap. And even that split second of hesitation can be enough to give you the advantage that you need to make the move successful. So just a brief rundown of some of the tactics that can play into this, but I, I would just, I would strongly recommend that you keep in mind, if you want to make this move stick, you have to make sure that it's going to be a tactically sound move and time it appropriately. Talking from it or talking about this from that perspective of trying to better your odds or find the best odds to make something like this work. The way that I try to think of it is if you can get your surrounding group to reach consensus, then you have a, a like a constant to work against. Otherwise there's too many variables. So like, what does this actually look like in a race? When you are in a group and you have a bunch of athletes and one attacks, and then you, they give up because everybody kind of chases and then another person attacks, another person attacks. You just have that going on, going on, going on until the group decides, okay, nothing is going away. Or until the group decides we're going to go faster. You have a lot of variables that are very far out of your control. So for you to put like some sort of big effort down, that's actually going to have detrimental consequences later on in the race. That doesn't make sense. What you want to do is once you have a group that actually has kind of decided how the race is going to be, you have to be, you have to be the sort of person that makes the foolish move, apparently foolish move. Mm -hmm. But if it's apparently foolish or if it's just timed, right. So that everybody is fatigued to a certain point or everybody's just like, I'm tired of everybody attacking. Let's reset for a bit. It's just, you need to make the right, the sort of move that looks foolish. And if you have a group that's all agreed upon with a certain thought or, or, or preconceived notion, then you can really play against that and make it work. So if you look at like all of Philippe, I, I bet his, like in terms of the athlete that he is absolutely world-class and possibly unprecedented, right? Like the stuff he can do on a bike is absolutely amazing, but it's his timing that is very, very good and his ability to read a race. And that's why he has so many of these moves where somebody sends in a question, they even brand it the Alaphilippe move, right? Is because he does this so often because he's very good at reading the race. If you look at it 
he's not often the sort of rider that in our local races, you know, you might be able to attack, attack, attack and hurt the field. And then one of your attack sticks, he knows that that's probably not going to work really well at the pro level when he's racing against Wout Van Aert, Matthew Vanderpool, and all these incredible athletes. So instead he knows that he just has to observe and take in everything and constantly weigh that. And if you look, he's very good at attacking once consensus has been reached and that he flips the script with whatever move he does. And then when that happens, everybody thinks, oh, it's foolish, or they're too tired to even think of, of attacking. And he has the fitness to be able to back up those foolish, <laughs> in quotes, moves, you know? Yeah, it's, top, it's top level tactical acumen. And, and he's got what very few riders have, but we're starting to see, you know, Ben Hart's got it, Vanderpool's got it. There are other riders who are, are capable of it. Sagan's particularly good at it as well. But they, they holster their weapon. They, they don't fire off a bunch of rounds and then hope that, you know, that one round is going to be the magical one. They, they've got, uh, I don't know, something that shoots one round, but it shoots a big round, you know, more like a hunting rifle as opposed to a revolver. And, and they wait and they deploy it at the right, at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's pretty clear that the tactics are, are definitely trainable. The, str the strategy is, is something that can be analyzed, but you, you can also look at the look at this from the physiological side of things. So if you recognize this is the sort of rider you want to be, this is the sort of tactic you want to employ, then you got to train your anaerobic work capacity um, or, or your anaerobic power. Uh, w prime, if you're a critical power person, but this can be trained and it can, it trains up really quickly, but it has to be trained in a specific manner. So you may see efforts done at 140, 150% earlier in base and, and definitely in build phase. But when it comes to specialty, you might see those same sort of efforts, but you're going to see a heck of a lot of recovery between them because we're trying to shift the demand from the aerobic system to the anaerobic system, really tax that system, let it recover really well so that we can do it highly productively again, again, again in the same workout. So this, this is a differentiator. You might see anaerobic looking efforts, but because they're closely stacked, it's pretty much aerobic in nature as, as the, the set goes on. But when you see those big breaks between it, and you'll see this in a specialty phase, we're trying to train up a particular capability so that you can use it in situations just like this. And then if we take the physiology just a step further and look at it from a strategic perspective, I attended a presentation a while back where they actually charted the depletion of phosphocreatine. So that really limited energy source, really important for punches like what we're describing right here, because once it depletes, it depletes and getting it back in the heat of battle isn't going to happen. So you have to play it really well. And they showed what happens when a sprinter who's being let out has to duck out to, to change position, maybe loses his lead out or her lead out and has to find a way back in or just, you know, things happen that they have to deal with and it spends some of their power and that little bit or some of this energy resource and that little bit of effect carries much, much farther reaching effects as they get closer to the line. I mean, it can be the difference between someone who sprints really well for 250 meters, only having a 150 meter sprint at the point, but they still initiate at 250 and they peter out early. No surprise to anybody. They didn't play it strategically as well as they could have. Um, I'm going <clears> to <throat> piggyback. I'm pretty much going to say what Amber said it in just a different way, but I, so one K from the finish, I'm going to question you, Ray. It, attack 1k from the finish is never a crazy move it is always <laughs> a threat a crazy moves like your 100k out and you attack and there are times where people go oh that's crazy they'll never make it and they do but 1k out it's always a crazy move and it's you you have to have hesitation if there is no hesitation you can't make it but if you get hesitation then you can make it and the ways are as amber said uh no one are teammates so if there are teammates it, it and teammates that are willing, that are fresh, it's very, uh, it's, it's probably not going to work. Or there's such a fitness disparity where someone can bridge and then still beat the people behind. And they know that, right? That, hey, I, I can cover this and still win. It is when uh, you go, and especially if you can have a huge speed differential from coming from the back, if everyone else thinks that if I cover this move, I will get last place in this group of five or six people. And they all do that. And that takes two seconds. Then you've won, right? As yeah. long as you can pace your effort, right. And you have the the ticket, it just takes two seconds. And, and that's enough because then it, it, every second that'll last longer, they all say, well, now I'm really going to lose like that chance to be able to cover and make it, it goes down and down and down. And they're just hoping that someone else takes it. And you can be lucky where 
the group waits like four sec. You wait four seconds, and somebody goes. Then, then you can they get kind of close enough, and then you go. That that is like the best situation, I think. And you can do a little bridge, and then you get a gap, and you can kind of sling shot past the person who is dying at the end. Like they give you a draft into the finish. Uh, but if being the person who does this kind of move, it's big speed differential. Especially, I was thinking of uh, I forget one of the crits in uh, like Central California. But it was a 35 plus cat four race or something my last one and they were coming in the last lap at like 17 miles per hour everyone was just thinking about a sprint and i don't know why everyone was going so slow and you can see me i actually gave like a 30 foot gap of a group of like 30 people because they were going so slow and i came by them at like 28 29 miles per hour and uh nobody chased it, it was yeah. you come by at that speed everyone goes well okay that's gone that's not it's mm -hmm. not gonna happen and is that consensus so, uh, right Everybody yeah. was kind of in the same mindset. So you just flip the script, right? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is, um, and by the way, if you're watching now, we're going to handle, uh, we're going to address a handful of live questions. So if you have any questions, submit them now in the live chat. And thanks for joining us and give us a thumbs up if you are enjoying it. Um, the, the other thing that I think of with this is that pro racing is different than amateur racing. And I know every race is different, but there are certain consistencies that are like, you know, when you are racing like Amber was, you're with truly a world-class field. Whereas a lot of us that are listening to this when we race, we're not against a world-class field, right? And so as a result, it changes things. We may not have teams that are really cooperative and functioning together really well. There, there are consistent principles that you can use across both scenarios, but context matters so much. Um, and yeah. this is why racing, and when you're talking about race strategy, the reason that context matters so much is because it's all based on relativity. It's you versus another person, right? Or you versus the elements or a thought that dynamics. a person has. <laughs> yeah. So this is why you have to be in these scenarios all the time. And that's why, you know, when uh, I really like watching races, like uh, when Chad and I watch races together, it's cool because Chad has a lot more racing now than I do. So I'm able to kind of listen to and see what he sees. And it's really helpful. Um, it's cool to, to really like get to know racers that have a lot of experience that aren't just, you know, like sipping their own Kool-Aid and think that they're the best and without, you know, uh, without chink in the armor, so to speak, but the athletes that are just like, yeah, I've seen this sort of, uh, they, they've seen a lot of things. And as a result, they're able to break a lot down. That's just really helpful. Like, like Amber as well. So hey, so much fun. I, I miss racing. So bad. I know it's, uh, we haven't <laughs> talked about this for a while. Uh, I want Amber's opinion on this, but I think the best thing too, if, okay, one K to go, let's say it's me and John. I attack with 1K to go and John's in the pack of like five. I think that makes it so much more likely for the group to go, oh, we're just gonna pull John up. We know John can kind of can, sp can sprint. And I think the likelihood then of one of us winning is extremely, is not extremely high, but a lot higher uh, than even a lead out at the end where then John has to go head to head with some other sprinter that could be on his wheel. What do you think about that, yeah. Amber, in that situation? I really like that tactic because you are hedging your bets in a really nice way. One is you're discouraging people from chasing because of John's presence. So it gives you a better, it increases your odds of making that move stick. And if somebody decides to ignore the fact that John's there and chase you, John gets a free ride across that gap and he's in a perfect position to counterattack. at which point you're blown and is left to a group of individuals to decide if they want to chase John down and he can be positioned toward the back of that group. So he does exactly what you did by accelerating from the back. So now, you know, unless they were really savvy and anticipating his move, which they should, but if they don't, then he has a really good chance of making his move stick. So I think that that's a really smart way to set it up for sure. Coming to a race if, analysis near you. <laughs> yeah. If, if we'll racing do doesn't come back soon, I'm going to start like Dungeons and Dragons, but bike racing. And like, we'll do it via Zoom. And like, Nate will be like, Jonathan just attacked. And then we'll have to decide. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, something, a, man. I miss it. I think it's I coming back in NorCal. Match. Before yeah. people message us, someone just messaged me the other day. There's some races now coming back. That's great. I, I just miss that chess match. There's something about it that's so like... um uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's mentally challenging, but there's, man, there's something really addicting about, it's probably the danger, all those other things going up that adrenaline and everything that we're experiencing, but then solving a problem amidst that, uh, yeah, it's, it's good brain candy for sure. So, um, okay, let's get into a handful of live questions. Uh, somebody, and, and I, I'm sure that this will be asked later on the forum too, looking for sleep tracker, uh, device recommendations. 
I honestly don't have any that I would recommend over another. I've used Apple Watch, Garmin, I've used Loop, I've used all those ones, and they're all basically the same in terms of their none I've found to be advantageous over another. Yeah, I think that's kind of what's going on here. I use the Aura Ring. So for, I don't know, last year, year and a half, I've been accumulating data and anecdotally making observations. When it says this, I feel this way. When it says this, I feel this way. And those things don't always align. So I, I don't know, even what the research is, this is something we should dig into at some point, but I don't know that any of the devices are reliable enough for you to actually really know what to expect from your sleep data each day. Well, there's quality and there's time, right? And I think for us, for AT, I'm thinking what we want to know is, did you get a nine hour or like a four hour or one of those ones that like really got lower? Because I don't, um, although it might say nine, maybe you're only slept for eight or eight and a half or something in there, but we're looking for those big disparities on days. Uh, that's yeah, what I'm thinking shift. that there'll be a strong enough signal for the actual quality. I'm, I'm with you, Chad, where I don't know if the data lines up with actual, um, when I, when I go to a sleep study, I think I have like 30 wires on me, like measuring things <laughs> all over the body about waking up and stuff. And I don't know how the accelerometer on your arm does that, that kind of that same thing. But, uh, I like the Apple watch uh, personally for tracking the numbers. How do you sleep with all that? Like, it's so ironic that you go to a sleep study and they like attach you with wires and like, you don't, and you I, have to sleep up, really well or, you know, I think I had in my last one, like 65 awakenings. And I was like, I woke up a lot. They're like, just, just because you're in this weird situation. And I was like, I kind of wake up a lot normally, but <laughs> they just brushed it off. Like, yeah, you're going to wake up a lot. <laughs> Crazy. Um, okay. Uh, another one, somebody says interesting topic on sleep. Can daytime rest compensate for shorter nights rest, i.e. a two hour nap in the afternoon, uh, compensating for not as much sleep at night. I'm not sure if we have like any science on this and our hard studies to really to simply from quickly. I haven't read anything that says it can compensate. It can complement. uh, in the case that you're getting enough sleep, there's the whole benefit in terms of mental acuity from really short naps. But as far as trying to make up for what you lost the night before, uh, this would be a super good topic for a deep dive, but nothing I've read has made it sound like, don't worry if you, if you only sleep six hours a night, as long as you can, can pick up an hour nap during the day, you're right as rain. Nothing mm -hmm. I've read seems to indicate that that's accurate. I'll, I'll second that. And then I'll just add one thing. And again, take this with a big grain of salt, because uh, this is, this is speaking from recollection. It's not something I've looked at recently. But I do recall seeing years ago some research on human growth or growth hormone released during sleep. And Chad mentioned this is it's a really having good regular sleep is really important to natural production and release of growth hormone. But I have read somewhere that naps can do the same thing. So sleeping after a big ride on the weekend, for example, might be really beneficial in terms of just uh, recuperating in terms of your own hormonal balance and growth hormone being one of those. So if you're interested in that, definitely look it up. There is information out there on it. Um, but I, I don't recall exactly the details on that, but I do think that that might be one benefit. Mm -hmm. Uh, another one says, how do you read when it's a good time to go for a long breakaway as a means to win a race? Is it just a crapshoot? And I think that there is something that's really important to, to bring in here. And it's kind of like a thing that frustrates me about like, uh, we see like YouTube race analysis videos, not like our videos where we analyze our own race, but somebody external that wasn't in the race that then looks at it. And a lot of the time it's delivered with this tone, like, well, of course it was obvious that this was the right move. And it was not obvious <laughs> when the racers obvious. were doing it. It's never <laughs> obvious. So like, I, I kind of have like, I kind of take umbrage with that, like tone that's like, well, of course this rider did this and this rider did this. And it was all mechanical and it just made it. And the fact is when you make a long move in a race, like when you, when you had, when you actually put the chips on the table for that, there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of luck too, with this, like, like you have to count on that. It's just recognizing how you can make the move seem foolish enough so that people won't chase, right. Or whether it's reading the pack and realizing that they aren't in a position to chase and knowing that you can back that up. But so much of it is luck. Um, I think one of the main things, if you are with the field and you're looking for a long breakaway opportunity, the race has to be hard enough to discourage that prior to that happening. Right. <clears throat> or they have to have a, uh, a, like a commonly agreed upon outcome of the race, like in Nate's situation, we're just going to sprint, even though it was in the last few laps, we're just going to sprint. You have to have that commonly agreed upon outcome very early on. And it has to be universal for you to be able to make that sort of move if the field isn't tired. 
Um, you can also look at things like the course and your strengths. If like, you know, that there's a, you're a really good climber and there's a long sustained steep climb, and that's really going to help you. And yeah, you can go for that, but you just have to be able to, you know, cash that check later on once it gets to the point where that climbs over, but there's always yeah. luck. I don't know. A simple way of thinking about it is a break will be successful when the chase can't or won't close the gap. Mm. Simple as that, but you can get real granular with that in terms of what does it mean that they can't close the gap? Well, if there's something mechanical about the course, like you're going through a chicane and it's physically difficult for them to chase you because of the technicality of the course or the narrowness of the course, if you can open a gap before that section, it makes it physically difficult for them to get to a high enough speed to start closing down the gap. That's one way, or they can't chase you down because they're too tired. Cause it's, you've just hit a really hard part of the course or they won't because of some psychological component, which might be that they're tired because there was just a flurry of attacks and maybe it wasn't that hard, but mentally people are feeling discouraged because they just chase down 15 attacks in a row and nothing's sticking. And then you go and it's just that moment of hesitation because they're discouraged. So they don't chase. So it's if, if the chase can't or won't close the gap, that's when the break is going to be successful. So that's where you need to ask yourself in the race, is this a moment where I could get away and not only could I get away, but is the chase capable and willing to close that gap and, um, and, and mm. figuring out what different factors play into answering that question can really help. I think yeah, one of the biggest uh, things too, is don't be a marked rider. If you're a marked rider, <laughs> you're not going to get away like straight you don't up. I always like, have a choice in that though. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So like when I, when we first started, when I first started road racing, and if Chad was in our races and Chad went early, like, good luck, Chad. Like you were not going to get away. The whole entire field was like, we cannot let Chad go because Chad can actually make that work. Right. So it wouldn't happen. Um, the, or you can be such a marked rider, like Justin Rossi, when he was in his prime in our local fields, a lot of the time when we have like our local Tuesday night world's races, when he would go, everybody would be like, quit. Yeah. never mind. We're just not even going to be able to chase him. Like <laughs> he's gone. So, you know, yeah. but if you are marked, man, it's just really hard to make anything work, you know, to that point, you can use that to your advantage is if there is a marked rider and you think they will not chase, you go for that long breakaway. Everyone looks to the mark rider to pull mm -hmm. it back. And if they're not willing to, to chase, everyone just sits and watches them. I've, I've been the marked rider in races, not because of anything like it was not yeah. smart. We had somebody, I think we were going like in the YouTube comments, like they, that guy nuked you at 220 Watts because we were going so slow and this guy just rode away. And I'm like, I'm not chasing. Like if yeah. I'll, I'll pull, I'll, I'll, uh, you know, I'll go off with someone, but they wanted me to do the whole thing. And I was like, I'm not doing it. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to set this up for years to come of that. I'm going to pull back everything. And he just rode away slowly at 220 Watts and ended up beating us. Uh, the other one, the video it's on TikTok. I just checked it has 1.2 million views. It's pretty, pretty cool, yeah. but it's where yeah. I did a 16 minute bridge. And, uh, afterwards racers told me that the, they thought there was no chance. So that's why they didn't go with me. The, I had let the gap go out so big that and then I did it, it, that that was foolish. And they're like, I, I was thinking about covering you, but I went by with such aggression and it the gap was so big that they're like, that's, he's not going to make it. So there's no point to doing that. And that's another kind of, you just got to make sure you make it. <laughs> in that yeah. Situation. There's a lot of, there's a lot of mental component to this too. It's not just if the, if the chase is physically capable, but like, are they mentally motivated to do it? Cause if it's a group of individuals mm -hmm. and they're looking at everybody else and no one wants to do the work, then, yeah. I mean, you could get away with not very much fitness <laughs> and yeah. still hold that gap open if no one's chasing you. <laughs> Another tip on how to not become a marked rider. You can either lose a lot and not win. That's one thing. Um, and you can be known for making silly moves. Also just don't start a YouTube race analysis channel where you break <laughs> down your own races. Cause <laughs> we've had that plenty of times where we're in the race. Nate and I have been in races before and people are like, well, I'm just waiting for you guys to execute the moves. We'll see on YouTube, you know? So they're just like, <laughs> we're not that good. So, like, no, we're not. We're not, the, like, we're not the best people in the race at all. The biggest danger and people right. are worried about us. Yeah. Yeah. So don't raise your profile in other words. So, um, thanks for everybody joining us on YouTube for this episode. This is awesome. The live chat was great. And it was an awesome, happy, friendly, curious tone in there too, which is just great. We hope that we can constantly 
push that forward with uh, having constructive debate in the YouTube comments and forum and everything else. You can go onto the forum and look for this episode. It's episode number 300. We didn't even talk about that in the beginning. <laughs> Y'all, it's just a number. I'm sorry. I know that we hit a hundred point mark, whatever, but it's just a number. Uh, we just want to make y'all faster. So thanks for listening to this. Share the podcast with your friends. That's a huge help. Also listen to the successful athletes podcast and science of getting faster podcasts. You can find those at trainerroad.com slash podcast. You'll be able to look at all of them there. And if you have questions that you want answered on this podcast, you can submit them. Just go to trainerroad.com once again, slash podcast. You can submit them there. And with all of that covered, we will talk to you all next week. Thanks everybody. Take care. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.